sure that we uh, should go into it. But he couldn't be here today. Um, uh, he's going to call back after this meeting, and I, I can include it. I'm just worried about the time. And I'm out looking for education. I have uh, with less for a fire alarm. Now, if we do get national experts and we get them on the screen, I hope we do some better publicity, more extensive publicity that brings people out because that, that may be something that will attract uh, a bigger audience because uh, it is a, a big controversial issue and, and, and uh, that is growing around the country at this point. Uh, that's my quick overview. Uh, we are going to have a meeting after this of whatever subcommittee meeting the meeting of members I can uh, get in to get the more specifics of all the questions I want to follow. Oh, yeah, he's the only other member so far. The thing seems like things are progressing uh, fine with you. Do you need any help in any regard from any of the members? I, I don't. I just wanted people to tell me they're comfortable in the directions I'm going. Mm -hmm. Only thing. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trained to like ask for permission. Um, <laughs> so they will listen to shit. Um, so I, I like the idea of bringing in national people. Um, I, I think we need to test it out in advance because I've been to too many things where something goes wrong and then everyone's sitting around for a while um, and it becomes a disaster technically. Um, and then the I, I agree with that. Kale and I have already started down that path. And then the second thing is I still think it's important to try to include some local people even if there's an overlap. Um, so I would encourage you to, if Jordan can maybe to think if there's a way even if it's brief, um, since he's a Vermonter. And then the other suggestion I would have, I thought of it when you said law enforcement, because I was thinking criminal justice, like courts and, and like lawyers and not police. That the police chief of Burlington has spoken about the use of artificial intelligence in policing, and he's done some research in it. So he'd be a good resource if, to either bring in as a local law enforcement officer who's looking into how AI, the benefits and risks, um, would apply to law enforcement, or he may refer you to other national ex experts. Um, so if we're thinking law enforcement, I want to just throw that out there as a suggestion. Yeah, that's where the in the in this area issue where I'm sorry I went right to law enforcement part of it. Um, is that's where the artificial intelligence activity seems to be the biggest. Of course, all those things end up in courts, uh, so they're involved in it. Uh, one of the problems with, co with uh, courts at the moment is the state courts are fine, but the federal courts are essentially on their shutdown. <laughs> I'm having a little uh, trouble talking. Yeah. One question, do you want an industry perspective on, on that? Can we my company owns something called Coupling, which is intelligence around you know, uh, perpetrators or something like that. And it would be just the kind of thing you would want to really understand and have determined. I mean, I think they're responsible, but it might be good to get a, a, a I like that introduction. Well, no, I, 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 they, are, they are scrupulously careful, but I think that that's other. Yes, if, if you would give me a contact, I would, yeah, I would do that. Uh, the subject is so large, it's so it's kind of crucial that I'm afraid it's going to eat up <laughs> every other activity that, that happens. And maybe we want that because we haven't really tackled the one this big in um, this controversial so far. Uh, so you'll give me a... You don't have to do it right at the moment. You'll, you'll give me the... Or do you want some of the Maybe we should put that to the group. <laughs> services, retail, and food. Um, I guess what I'm asking is we should discuss um, 
subcommittee members uh, and perhaps the subcommittee chair to get that organized for March, hear from them. What date did we pick? It's March 22nd, I think. Right? Oh, yeah, there it is. It is. Uh, I, I, must, I, I must admit that I have this fear that we're running out of this approach. In other words, and, and this came from the discussion with your social worker was when you realize that uh, the nature of the issue and the nature of uh, the AI application um, overlap with somewhere else that essentially is doing the same thing and has the same issues, although it happens to be in a different part of uh, our list of the various uh, parts of the world that do artificial intelligence. And I'm wondering uh, that March being a subject with, uh, is needed and uh, whether it would be better to start getting to a more serious discussion about what we're going to come up with. Yeah. <laughs> So, are, are you that's a that? question. That's a question. So, you questioning if maybe it's time for us to shift our focus towards yes. towards working on the report and recommendations yes. and processing everything you've been receiving. Yeah, that was. Yeah. Okay. I, I I see the humility side as well. Yeah, I do too. And I also think that we need to. We had talked about doing some public engagement beyond the commission, and maybe it's time, like, to think about. Like our meetings being focused on synthesizing or going analyzing, and uh, and then having some meetings that are not task force meetings, but public forums, you know that piece, so that we can gather some feedback from the public, maybe in March and April to integrate the report. I would like to add that we should have some these experts that we bring to these meetings at the public forum so that people can get a taste for what's out there instead of us regurgitating what we understand. I view, I view, I'm okay with that idea. I, when I said public forum, I didn't think that we were going to get up there and like teach people things. I actually viewed it as opening it up to the people and saying to the people of Vermont, what are your concerns and your questions? What do you want us to be thinking about? Um, because when I when I was on the radio with Milo, well, you weren't on with me. They recorded you. But I was on with, um, with um, some of the digital services. So many people called in with questions and concerns, like so many, and it was a lot of fear. And so I think we need to create a space for people to express that and ask their questions. And we need to validate people's concerns. And then we may not have the answers, but I think that their questions could inform what ends up. And you know, so that's, I'm fine with having some people talk too. And doing public education, but that um, that I, would, I I think we have to balance that with giving people a, a, a venue for their voice. What was that? Was that before the test? Yeah, it was before it was formal. We were when we when Milo and I were like like lobbying, you know, working on it, and uh, and you can go online and it's still there. Um, you can give me any critiques you have as AI experts on what I said, but. Um, but they had me, and they had, um, I don't know if it's titled Secretary Quinn, or yes. Secretary Quinn, yeah, Secretary Quinn, and myself were live, and then they had recorded Milo, and had a little interview with him, so. But there were a lot of questions, so that's, I think that was my point, bringing that up. So what I'm hearing is, speakers did at this meeting, and then in February, there's not really a need to go beyond that, and then from there. Start our uh, public public engagement. I don't think that we had the March one on the calendar. Did we actually have it? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I had to move it. March twenty second. Yeah. Okay. Do we still have? Um, so do we still have a? Like a public outreach work group? I mean, is that, are we going to be thinking about the, the mechanisms that we do that? I know that we have talked about Vermont edition and some other thoughts, but the mechanics of Well, I think I that we want to refer to these public meetings to that group. Is that? I was thinking, uh, maybe think? also, but I think the idea, it sounds to me like, Brian, that there was a lot of 
pent up interest and, and, and concern, and, and it would be great to have a forum that is explicitly you know, it's global, but, uh, global, regionally global, that we would actually allow people to kind of come in, and that, to have people join us here. That's a big commitment. Relatively few people would do that. But I think a, a, another radio kind of thing or something like that where there's participation, I think that could be very powerful. And uh, it would also get us a, a sense, it, it would improve our transparency and we get a sense of that kind of concern. So do we sell a group that's doing that? That's thinking that group? Could we, we maybe can revive that? Re I think so. We haven't met in the last one. Yeah, right. But we should probably we should probably kick that back in gear so that when we get past March, we have a problem. Could we go back to the radio broadcast and compile it at least the questions that were already called in, so that we have a starting point and maybe categorizing people's concerns? You're right, Nia. Negative. Okay. The AI program that goes through the internet and gathers every question that anyone. No, it's just on the question. Oh, the transcript of the question. Oh, okay. Exactly. <laughs> At the next meeting, uh, if uh, I can get together who the witnesses are in the, uh, two weeks before the meeting, and we're now about five weeks ago, um, the, that uh, if you could find a way to publicize it, because um, I think this subject will bring out people. Uh, a bit more than some of the others uh, might have been, even if we're going to, it just means we have more people here in the Montpelier room. Yes. So, you have some contact with Vermont mm -hmm. Public Radio and these, this is something that we could invite them to. So, yeah, broadcast and that will be a venue for us to get the word out. I'm willing to reach out to them for sure. They, they were interested in mm -hmm. follow up, right? Yeah. Curious um, how the members of the public that are here now heard about this. Can you guys share? I'm just curious. I heard about it because uh, Representative Senna put a post on the front porch forum. About the rest of you. Yeah, I'm, I'm here with Trey. Probably. Oh, okay. Our speakers. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just did a Google search for artificial intelligence for mom and uh -oh. shut up. Yeah. You're like a roll of the dice. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. um, I am the legislative intern at the House Health Committee, so I heard about it from. So I did send out a press release and I did hear from the Vermont Public Radio and responded to, but I thought it was spammy. So I knew to contact the National AFL-CIO and I'll see if we can up our game here. I've been posting on um, Front Porch Forum my own little, like, like my my updates because we don't have like an official group update each 10 minutes. So I, I've been writing my own little summary and sending it out from me with a link to the website. And I had uh, multiple constituents write to me and one of them actually was like, three of them actually were like, you put the wrong date because we had changed the date and I had put, so I had written it before we changed. So I was like, this is awesome that actually four people caught my mistake and like, check, like we're checking. So I think um, another brand new people may consider, especially because there are people here from different regions in the state would be, um, front porch form postings. Um, I think a question I would have is like, I was writing my own updates for my constituents because I feel like I owe them explanations, but that's not from me, not the task force. And that there might be some benefit to the task force actually having a press release or a statement that we all send out that's consistent, that's the updates. Um, just a thought, you know, because that's another venue. So I did uh, email from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development does not do more press releases. So that's good in some way or form beyond us. Um, and I can send out a press release because I have that capacity. But it's really, I know John, you spoke to me about having it 
female representatives, but I just don't, I mean, unless the agency is going to decide something that they want to do, um, I'm not, I'm not certain of that. Okay. I was very brief. I did not include the list of the speakers because that wasn't on the website. We really just put information from the website on the press release. Part of the reason I would like to get the information out earlier, I mean, I knew about the speakers as of yesterday, so uh, for today, but if we can get them out earlier before the meeting, like, and this is maybe our last opportunity to do it, then the opportunities for publicity become much greater than uh, just simply having a meeting, and this is the general subject. Can I say something? So I chose the original speakers for the meeting times based on what I thought like normal when the people that could meet would be available, um, which might mean that some people of the public won't be available. Would I don't know if the committee would want to schedule meetings not during normal business hours. You mean like on a Friday night? Yeah, or a Saturday. Not on a Friday night. <laughs> just a, just a something I noticed, because nobody asked me what dates to meet. I chose them. Yeah, so maybe a Thursday or Wednesday night rather than Friday night. Yeah, just to be thought. <laughs> Yeah, so. for me, I do miss three classes on each Friday, so it's an hour drive each way. So next time I'm going to have to skip it. Well, can I ask a group of question? Like, would, would, how would it work if we did it on Wednesday or Thursday night? Like, can, can, like, just play along with me for a minute. Like, if it was a Wednesday night, who could talk? Who could make that work? Thursday. If it was a Thursday, if it was a Wednesday night, who could make it work? Uh, if it was a Thursday night, who can make it work? Sure. So we'd be excluding two people doing it at night, is what I'm saying. It's like our live doodle poll right here. That's great. <laughs> so might the committee want to do that? I'm not comfortable with excluding Milo and Jean. So. There's always some people that can't make the time. And I can but Skype it. Well. Yeah. I or can't do Thursday at all, but I might be able to Skype it on Wednesday. And I'm usually in Cambridge on the I could say. Well, I mean, I think when we do, when we have a, you know, a, a true public meeting where we're going to go out and, and want to hear from the general public, then that absolutely should be on evening. And it doesn't need to be four hours long. Yes. <laughs> that's, hours, yeah, that's different. Yeah. Two hours, an hour may be enough. It really just depends on how many people kind of show up. But you schedule two hours. But the meeting of our group, um, I think this last meeting could still be during the day, you know, during the time that, that sort of the listening to the experts for the hours. Um, but if everybody wants that to be a four hour meeting in the evening, Does it have that would be okay too, but you know, it really need to be like. I wasn't suggesting change yeah. the next one. I'm just okay. saying yeah. a public meeting, trying to get people there is a lot to be said for a more relaxed setting, and most AI happens over here. Just saying, is that is that strictly? I mean, could we have an informal meeting in a place where people could eat and drink? Of the task force, maybe either the task force or the task force in the public. I think the public meeting could be somewhere more informal, but I think a task force meeting in a place that serves alcohol is probably not a good idea. Will that be in the definition of AI that we come to later on? Or the video on the part of the nation? I'm serious. I think it might, it might allow people to, but I understand that that's an issue. I don't know. The, the AI meeting space, you have one in Burlington, right? On my screen, you want to have it? Yeah. Oh, the uh, generator. I can, I can offer the generator. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a great place. Is that is there a uh, it's on the Champlain campus? It's uh, we can hold up to 160 people. I think. You're thinking for the forum, for the forum, and we could that might be really a good forum for it. And I think we talked about having more than one forum, like in different regions. And so perhaps the, the Chittenden County forums there, and we look at one or two or three other ones in other parts of the state, we all don't have to go to every forum. But don't you have another space in southern Vermont? There is another maker space down there that we're loosely associated with, but perhaps we could. What town? Uh, probably one. Okay. That would be another great place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The other corner. Yeah. And I, I, 
do you think it would be good to be able to go to a place where you get, you know, not to just make this shit in county? My only concern about too much going in this direction, and I'm emphasizing too much not going in this direction part, is that we leave ourselves less and less time to reach any conclusions and have any discussion of this. So, uh, and I, I don't know, it's hard to predict how hard or easy it will be to come to uh, conclusions or recommendations uh, for this, but, um, and of course we can always ask for more time and maybe that is an expectation and more meetings or whatever, uh, but I just want to be sure we, we have enough time set aside to, to be able to seriously grapple with what is going to be a complex uh, uh, issues, issues to, to make recommendations. I wonder, you know, the, the meeting and uh, the report that we have due in February, whatever that, what's the date on that? February 15th. And is that the place where we would want to ask, you know, the committee just for some more space? And we'll, you know, they're saying June, and really we don't need to report back to them, practically speaking, until they're back in session in 2020. So what's, what's the point of this June deadline, and can we get some more flexibility on that, and a little bit more flexibility if we have to meet a couple more times to kind of talk through some issues? And if that's the case, can we request that? Should we be requesting that now? I think that's probably a good idea. I agree. Uh, I think if people are willing to go into the fall, um, I'm willing, uh, that more time and more meetings uh, are indicated, and that then you could clearly have enough time to go around before the public meeting. I would like to suggest that um, well, depending on what the results are, but we hold one meeting possibly in Burlington just for an extension because it was actually there was a J in the bill but I think you should be honest with them about the progress of the work and, and that what we're finding is that this isn't that we're, we're just scratching the tip of an iceberg because one of the questions for us was what ongoing work is needed is a commission needed or some ongoing investigation so I think people should, we should be honest in February of, of how much is coming up and how the deadline is posing a problem and then the you know, see what the committees say to us, what guidance they give us about what they think we should do. So be prepared to um, well, ask for additional meetings, but be prepared not, not to have those accepted? Yeah, be prepared to, yeah, I guess we should be prepared that we're going to be told, no, we need a report wherever you're at on that date, because the law says you have to give it to us. But I mean, we in our report, we could say we need you to extend our work for a year, and we're all willing to do it for free, like we are, you know. Or we could say you need to institute a commission, or we could say you need to like build a giant artificial intelligence to manage the government right now. I mean, we could say whatever conclusion we had. I was joking. <laughs> that wasn't one of my recommendations. No, not my either. I was joking. But uh, the other pieces, I was serious. Um, I think we need to just be honest to where we're at, and then the report needs to be an honest representation of where we're at. So uh, I, uh, let me then make a motion that is in the report, which we still have to get out, of course, the rest of, uh, that we asked for a uh, extension, whether it has to be by law, bail law, or can be done by the committees, uh, to January 1, and uh, such other meetings as we can get done between uh, June and January 1. Uh, it doesn't have to be a specific number, but whatever. As we determine, that's what I would Yeah, yeah as we, we determine our necessary. So, so that's a, uh, I'm trying to get closer. I'll second the motion. I move that we extend the deadline for public meetings to January 1. I'll move to college by then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to go through the summer, and especially when it opens up a couple of opportunities. But well, I'm hoping they're going to be very well meetings. Yeah. Yeah.
So I would like to say that I think waiting till January, I think we should move, be, be prepared for January, and there's some legislators in this room, perhaps they can help me with what I'm about to say. I have noticed that uh, agencies do not necessarily report to the legislature in a timely manner, and I noticed this because in committees, the legislators will explain that to the agency. <coughs> so I don't think it's dramatic to ask for more time, but should be punctual in our request. And I also think that these committees do some work during the non-legislative session. So I think we should, when they ask for something for June, we should do our best to kind of get it to them to September because the committee chair is going to do something with this information. So will I take that as a friendly amendment to yeah. not say January 1, but to say September 30th? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can I just add something that, that um, if you know, two people mention that you may have to step away from the work at some point, and that if that happens for anyone, that we were all appointed through a process, and I think that process would replace us. And so if you have to go up to MIT and you can't, you know, use virtual reality in the MIT Media Lab to be here with us in some way, then the governor would appoint another student, and if you can't, then you won't have time. I think the Senate appointed you, right? Or, yeah, so the Senate, the Committee on Committees would appoint another professor. Rumor it is, MIT's hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay, okay with that. I'm okay with that like amendment to <laughs> September 30th. Okay. Did you already have that? I got it. He's in. We're just yeah, requesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Motion is said there. I said that. I said that amendment. Is there any other discussion about this topic? Uh, about extending to September 30th additional meetings? Are you asking for specific meetings or just in general? Yeah, in, in, in general. Okay. It, it, just to be clear, that the motion was that in the February 15th update to the legislature, that the person who gives that update is going to share the progress of our work and let them know we need more time and ask for an extension if possible. And, it, and we're going to be prepared to give a report at the deadline either way. It just may not be as good as if we had more time. Well, I think we would give a report, report in June and then That's the what I mean. final report. Yeah, that's sure. what I mean. Like, we're going to give one in June no matter what, but we're asking for more time to, before the final. Yes. Okay. That, that was the sense of the amendment. Um, okay. But, uh, this, this report, though, on February 4th to 15th, you said, is that what it is? Mm -hmm. Is from every, all of us. I mean, it's a commission report. It's not from one. But someone's going to have to go. We're not all going to go stand in front of energy and technology. No, no, no. Okay. I hope we're going to get a well written report that we all agree on, right? Yeah. The idea. In fact, the problem okay. is that since our next meeting is February 22nd, all agree on uh, can't occur at another meeting. It either occurs now or by some means in the next month. I do think we should have a um, meeting. Can we vote on that motion and then talk about how to do the report? Yeah. Uh, so the motion is to, again, February 15th update report uh, provided you know, after additional meetings and, and September 30th deadline for a final report without eliminating the June 30th report requirement. Sorry. Uh, uh, yes. Second. Uh, yay. Ayes. Uh, Aye. Nays. <laughs> motion passed. Uh, and and uh, you tell I'm happy to write that line, give you that language for this line. If we're going to use that for the final work. So we'll see what the comments are. I was going to say we're about out of time, but we'll go uh, based on the agenda speaking, uh, being with the speakers. How about we move about discussing uh, a meeting prior to the February 15th submission until after the speakers are um, yep. have presented? Uh, right, one other thing, uh, it's a requirement of the subcommittee chair to bring cookies, and uh, changes are done. All the prior uh, <laughs> subcommittee chairs, they're there, they're here, and at some point you'll be required to eat at least one. Which one do you want?
uh, one closer to you, that's all. Okay. Yeah, one closer to you. Last time we would do, you know, we kind of had this method where every five minutes another one would go down. So yeah. we have a closer to you. Yeah. 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 See when you start to put all your bigger hands in the cookies, then you're going to tell us about that dollar. Yeah. Raise up the coming. Yes, it is. Is there a way to automate this? You guys don't. While you're in it on cookies, I just want to let people know like that I, I'm looking at the at, at Act 137 and it says that this task force shall cease to exist on June 30th, 2019. So that's just something to know that by act, asking for an extension, I don't know what that's going to mean. Um, well, it might be, they might need to. They yeah, might be like changing the law or something. I plan to be here on July 1st. Can we pass some back to our guy? You can take these calls, calls next to back to our friend back here in my office. Mm -hmm. On MIT. Thank you. You want to get in? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, let's get a bit of the Also, just a quick update. Um, so we had a speaker for the insurance segment. Due to, how should I say, due to a uh, legal process issue, it couldn't get done in time. Um, so the speaker has, and this is a, a Mr. Nimesh Meda from National Life, those of you who haven't heard about it. Uh, he has graciously volunteered, though, to appear at one of our later meetings. So this is something that now that we have the discussions of over the new post-March, this is one more person we could bring in. So I had a long discussion with him. He had a lot of interesting things to say about someone endorsing that way. But I said because of a, a legal process issue, he couldn't resolve. But it, should, it would be resolved in time for the next one. OK? So uh, again, by way of quick introduction, um, since I'm going to push off the insurance piece, this is going to be talking about AI and medical and health care. We have four speakers today. Our first speaker is Dr. Nicoletta Sidoropoulos. Forgive me, sometimes I might slaughter that. I think he's fine. <laughs> so I think what we'll do is, if it's OK, so we just go ahead and get started with the speaker. That was all I have for the introduction, unless anybody from the committee want to add something, subcommittee? OK, so let me just give a brief introduction. So the format, I'll give a brief introduction of the speakers. The task force panel members will do a very brief introduction of themselves. Uh, and then uh, the speakers give their preparatory statement and some things you'd like to talk about. Then we'll open up the Q&A to the task force and then recommendations by the speakers. So I assume that was what we were following anyways in the past. So let me have a very quick introduction. Um, uh, Nikki is the founder and inaugural medical director of the Genomic Medicine Program at UVM Medical Center. Uh, she founds and directs the Geno uh, oops, Genomic Oncology Tumor Board, founder and co-director of the Northern New England Genomics Consortium, and she has a lot of interesting things to talk about. So <laughs> let me go ahead and with that introduction, let's do a quick uh, around the task force. Yeah, I'm so curious who everybody is. <laughs> All right, John Dooley. I'm a retired judge, which means I know nothing about anything. <laughs> <laughs> Trade ops in emergency medicine with Dr. Hitchcock and Dr. Fitting. Brian Breslin, I'm a civil engineer with the William King in private engineering. John Cohn, 37 years with IBM as an IBM fellow, but I work at MIT. In, in oh. I'm Brian Chino, I'm a clinical social worker. I'm, I'm uh, the member from the NASW, National Association of Social Workers, uh, with experience in human rights. Donna Rizzo, I'm at UVM. Yes, you work with one of my friend Carr. Exactly. Great. I do a lot of research with AI related to either medical or environmental issues. Excellent. Jill Sharmo, President of Vermont AFL-CIO, I'm a retired letter carrier. I'm Mark Holmes, I'm the Chief Technology Officer for the State of Vermont, Agency to Health Services. I'm Joe Sigali, I'm the Director of Policy and Planning and Research for the Agency of Transportation. I'm Myla Kress. I'm a CU student and uh, 
AI enthusiasts. Um, so, so by way of training, I am a physician. Um, I did my medical. I'm from Connecticut originally. Um, I did my medical school at University of Connecticut uh, School of Medicine, and um, subsequently decided that pathology was the choice for me. I did my residency at Dartmouth Hitchcock, um, so down the road, and uh, subsequently did a cytopathology fellowship at the University of Vermont Medical Center, then Fletcher Allen. Um, that particular specialty uh, was um, very much about minimally invasive biopsy. So we were at the forefront with patients, um, in particular in the in the <coughs> space, and um, you know we were doing lots of these really small kind of cellular biopsies on patients, and that was right around the time when. Um, uh, targeted precision therapeutics were coming to market for cancer. Um, I was charged with, you know, what should a project be uh, for, for me academically that year. And um, I had come out of Dartmouth, and I think hindsight is 2020. We had a very progressive molecular diagnostic lab there. I think I kind of assumed everybody had that. And, and what I quickly realized and was told was that we didn't necessarily have any of that at the University of Vermont in the clinical laboratory space. Um, and so um, my whole uh, hope was that we were doing these amazing small biopsies on cancer patients, and we needed to now be getting uh, genomic or, or gene sequencing information out of these tumors to then open up options for patients to um, you know, give them precision medicines as opposed to kind of more generalized chemotherapy with all the generalized side effects. So um, I quickly decided I couldn't move forward in my career as a uh, pathologist, um, especially in a clinical diagnostic lab um, in, in the space of cancer, which is my interest, um, without understanding uh, molecular techniques, which then quickly led me to, uh, you know, and, and drag my husband, uh, who's a psychiatrist, out of Vermont, which was heartbreaking, but we went to San Francisco to UCSF, um, and I did my molecular genetic pathology training out there. Um, I ultimately stayed on faculty out there and was starting a genomic medicine lab. It was not my intention to become a medical director of genomic medicine. I just wanted to be able to feel confident in those techniques and use them in the cytopathology diagnostic space. But I think once that was around the time of 2010-11, when this new technology, well, relatively new, I think, for people in the clinical lab, um, next generation sequencing was, was actually, uh, the price point dropped enough the machines became accessible enough, and that was starting to move into the clinical laboratory space. So this was a technology when I landed at UCSF um, with a just huge, you know, uh, uh, research, um, I guess, space there um, at that medical center in that college of medicine. I would say that there was a ton of expertise in the Bay Area from the pharma, biotech, research perspective on generating genomic sequence information. Um, it, was, it was all of a sudden entering into the clinical space um, and people were, were really trying to get up to speed on how do we bring this in and how do we get this paid for in the clinical lab and, and how do we apply it to clinical care for patients. Um, so, so that is, is a general idea of just my background and how I, how I got to be here, um, which was when, when the medical center um, was, and, and, and the department of pathology were looking for a new chair. It just so happens that um, Dr. Deborah Leonard um, moved up here from Wild Cornell. Her, she is really one of, I think, viewed, it's safe to say, as a founder of molecular diagnostics in this country. So. It was her vision that aligned with the medical center's vision, um, the leadership to say, okay, we are going to invest in genomics, clinical grade genomics. This is not research, this is now clinical. And um, when I, you know, I, I took the position as the medical director, we were thrilled to come back to Vermont. Um, it's, it's home despite San Francisco being absolutely amazing and not really looking to leave because it was a wonderful opportunity there as well. 
But in coming back here in, in late 2013, one of the first things we did was we set out to do a, a business plan. And so um, that really was a five-year plan and has gotten us to where we are today. Um, you know, we were initially, we didn't, we were squatting in cancer center lab space. So now we actually have a state-of-the-art laboratory facility. We have all of the basic staffing we need and, and, and basic infrastructure that we need to do clinical grade genomics. We are actually doing this testing um, in, and this is a CLIA licensed um, College of American Pathologists accredited laboratory um, within the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. And so we, um, you know, we have the infrastructure in place and are offering this testing. Um, the first test that we offered, we do DNA and RNA-based sequencing, um, and uh, we uh, report into the, you know, EPIC, which is our uh, electronic health record. So um, that is that. That's just to give you a sense as to how this how this space has been evolving, where we are currently. I think we it was part of our mission to become a nationally recognized genomic medicine program. Um, we are all about building care pathways, not the classic model, paternalistic model of a lab. You know, people probably need this test, let's develop it and put it out there and you can order it if you want as a physician. That's not how this works. We actually engage with the physicians, um, you know, let's say in the oncology space, what is the information that you need to treat and what do we know as the molecular or genomic experts to say, you know, this is what's coming, this is what we can actually do, and this is how we match up your need with what can be done, and how do we then deliver um, and, and really be a facilitator not only of this information back to the patient, but also to educate underneath it all our, our patients, our community of peers, um, the, the lay public, um, the, uh, you know, in, in government, um, payers, how, how do we do all of that? And, and that's currently um, what, how we're operating. Um, I will say that, you know, so I am board certified across all areas of laboratory practice in general, um, and, and obviously cytopathology, I mentioned in molecular pathology, but it was, I think, one of the biggest challenges um, to where, uh, to, to getting this thing off the ground, if you will, um, was, not so much bioinformatics. You know, we kind of do the wet bench work in the lab. We generate sequence. We have to make sense of that sequence um, and and then make an interpretation. It's more around how do we then get this information back into the electronic health record in a way that it's visible and usable, and it's not just buried in some scanned media tab of the electronic health record. How do we make this, and how do we triangulate this data with other pieces of information? Because you know there are certain things about the genome that are binary. I mean, you, you have something or you don't, and it you know it's black and white, and that's that's the very small proportion of the genome. Most of it is only can make sense when you start triangulating it with other pieces of information. So I think that it it, it was probably a year and a half, two years ago. I'm realizing now that the clinical informatics around how you connect all these pieces is one of the most challenging things, which led me to be grandfathered in to take the boards of clinical informatics. So I'm actually, there's about six or seven of us in, in the state of Vermont, um, and I felt like to have that board certification would get me a seat at the table to then talk with our CIO, our CMIO around, you know, and those are our chief medical informatics officer, our chief informatics officer. How do I then start interacting with our information system team to, to educate them around how we bring genomics to light to ultimately view and be able to obtain what is the promise of or the hypothesis of genomic medicine, which is, you know, we can, yeah, targeted therapy. How do we how do we tailor your therapy compared to your therapy compared to, you know, what, what you may need? Um, so that's really the promise, that's what was invested in. There's a whole population health initiative um, in, in the health network. So, so how do we make that happen? So that's why I became a clinical informaticist, not because I needed another board certification. 
So I will say that um, there is a lot of awareness. Um, we do have a great infrastructure. We are really uh, at, the, at the bleeding edge of where a lot of labs are nationally offering this testing. But we are really at a point now where we're generating the information. Um, there's, there's a lot of on ongoing effort around how we're going to structure and build out the electronic health record to make sure that this information gets to where it needs to be. Um, I think that AI, um, in terms of how, where does it fit in with this field, um, you know, there certainly is a lot of AI use in the research efforts to understand the human genome. The data is massive, and you know, how do you interpret what this information is? And I think the you, you certainly need artificial intelligence to assist in that in that ongoing effort. We don't understand the majority of the genome. Um, and, and certainly, when you're talking about a genome, it's not just you're looking at one base, which is a binary change. You really have to say, okay, there's that change, and this change, and this change, and what do they all mean when they're together, right? So, so that's where we have to start layering on this kind of artificial intelligence, I think. That stuff's happening in the, uh, in, in the non-clinical space, but I think the question is, how do we bring that into the clinical space? Um, how do we, number one, interpret genomic sequencing data in a way that's scalable so that all patients can have access to this? And number two, um, once that's done, and if that's done correctly and appropriately and, and, and in a scalable way, and that information then is put into the electronic health record, how do clinicians um, and, uh, you know, people who are involved in uh, the healthcare management and how dollars are spent and all, sort, all sorts of people on, on, on that end of the spectrum as well, you know, business intelligence, how do we then, you know, there's clinical decision making that has to incorporate this information um, and it has to be triangulated with other pieces of information. It's very frustrating for clinicians in the cancer space to get one report about what the cells look like under the microscope, another report as to what test A means, another report with what test B means, and then they get this genomic information, and they have to put that all together, and that's a really difficult exercise. So how do we, how do we get there? And I think that it would be, ideally, you would want to have AI implemented in a way that would support you know, pulling data together and helping and facilitating physicians to make decisions based on all of these individual inputs of information. So um, I do think there is a role um, for AI. I think we're very well poised in this state. Uh, you know, we're small and mighty, actually, I think, when it comes to, um, in, in regards to this space. Um, I think we are perfectly poised to implement AI when it's available. Um, I don't necessarily think there's clinical grade AI right now that is available, but I think it's on the, you know, at, we're, we're beginning to really get into that space and have those conversations. Um, so the question would be, how do we vet which, you know, what, which form of AI would be appropriate? Um, that's clearly a very important decision. How do we implement that? And how do we then you know, in, in the clinical space, which you know we have to protect patient data, right? And we do that. We do that pretty well. And and how do we make sure that this also is is you know vetted and protected in, in the same way? And then how do we um, you know how do we make sure that there's there's quality control and quality assurance that is ongoing of this information, right? You certainly don't want your AI to falter. And, and, and triangulate the wrong pieces of information, and then that ultimately means you're making the wrong decision for a patient. So, so there's patient safety issues there. So I think, you know, ultimately in the end, when I thought about, you know, uh, we do have, I think, all the infrastructure to, to make the right decisions and to monitor these systems. I think it's just very important. Laboratory professionals are, Steeped, clinical laboratory professionals are steeped in quality control and quality assurance. It is what we do every day, day in and day out, which makes 
our testing more expensive than what it would be in the research space. We're running extra controls every time we test. We're looking and running reports on, and, and you know, unless something passes that QC, it's not going to be reported. You want to make sure if you're getting results out of a clinical lab that the result is accurate and correct and precise. So, so we have to make sure all those things are, are ongoing to maintain um, to maintain reporting and decision making. So I, I think um, that's kind of a, a overview summary of who I am, what I'm doing, uh, where where the clinical genomic space currently is, where we want to go, um, and, and uh, what we need um, to, to move forward and actually see the value of what we've invested in today with genomics. Yeah. So I just wanted to mention um, scaling, right? Yeah. And so at what point right now, um, you said, you know, Bioinformatics, genomics, you know, precise medical treatment is not reaching sort of a scale. Is it happening at all in Vermont? Or is it, because I I know some folks down in New York, I say Sloan Kettering, mm -hmm. you know, they, they'll go in and they'll do the genome, uh, you know, screen of your DNA. And, they, yes. and they've got some forms of cancer that they can tell you that you can get better results depending upon treatments and your DNA sequence and stuff. Right. Or, is that is scaling that to becoming you know having real impact on public health? Is that an issue of like compute power, money, um, just knowing more about the genomic genomic sequence of, of the public so that bioinformatics sharing could be very helpful? Um, what sorts of roadblocks are out there for that scaling that you're talking about? Um, I mean, so we we currently are doing that same testing. Um, we're doing it. Uh, for patients who are, um, you know, with certain types of tumors that are being sampled at the medical center, yeah. um, and that's that's where we are currently. Um, I think that we the the interpretation of what the results are mm -hmm. um, is a challenge. Okay. Um, we have four faculty members who are specifically trained in this field to do this type of interpretation. But there are cases where, you know, this is not just a matter of you have this mutation or you don't. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, um, you know, you may canvas upwards of a dozen or two manuscripts, check however many databases to interpret one interpretation, you know, one variant. And then you have to do the same thing for another. And then you have to figure out, well, what do the two mean when they're in combination? Right. And right now, there is a lot of expert manual curation of endless resources right. or, or not enough reasons. It's like, it's like feast or famine, right? You either have information and it's overload or you don't. Right. And, and, and that is what we're, that's what we're going through right now. So I think to, to say we're going to, I mean, to sign out, you know, seven reports and do a real good clinical grade interpretation, it is being done very manually right now. So, so there, there would be, we would need to rely upon systems that could pull a whole lot of the pertinent data sources, provide it to us as the pathologist doing the interpretation, and that would permit us to then, you know, be more, uh, I think, be, be be able to scale how many interpretations we're doing a week. Okay. Um, that's important. Can I add on to that? Uh, sure. so my company, IBM's been working this problem for a long time and getting beat up a lot. Uh, <laughs> we've done some work with Sloan Kettering and Andy Anderson. Yes. And I think to some extent, you know, we sort of thought, oh, well, once you get the genome, you know, why could it be hard? But it turns out, <laughs> I I'm curious, the question you just asked about, what is the gate to the AI? And what I hear from my colleagues is that, that some art, I mean, the data is hard to come by in terms of efficacy, you know, outcomes, and the privacy is, you know, is always in a dynamic uh, opposition to data. To what extent is access to the actual outcomes and, and the cases gaining, you know, AI gaining actual practice? Is that is that the key problem? Because I don't think it's compute power. It's that that's, the, that's kind of what I was wondering. Yeah, right? I, that's what I want to know. Is what's, <laughs> You know, there was huge promise about it, 
you know, bioinformatics and then AI, yeah. but it hasn't been as easy. What is that part? Is it? Well, so I think in, in, in doing the interpretation, like I said, I mean, you know, there it would be um, it would be there are many many sources that you have to check to make sense of what a variant is and what does it mean clinically, right? And so that is a real I think that's a space where AI, if it could learn from what are the sources we use, you know, how can it present information to us so that we're not spending the majority of our time. I mean, there's, you can think about it like an iceberg, right? And you spend the majority of your time searching for the information, and we, it, but it's, it's very, very manual. Um, and so once the information is, is, and you want to make sure the way you're searching across all the data sources is, you know, very uniform. You don't want, you know, pathologist A, you know, missing certain points and pathologist B missing other points, and if pathologist A, you know, happened to, you know, find a paper that the other one didn't find because of how they searched, so you would want to, I think, put in um, a more standardized process of how data is presented to the in interpreter, and and then it's the it's really that evens the playing field, and I would say it's that there's a big part right there between where the sequence comes out, and that's all, we feel really great about how the assays function. We do right. that really well. Right. But there's that bottom part of the iceberg of identifying and uniformly identifying the information, feeling like we're not missing anything. Right, so one of our key goals in our reporting is gonna be what are, what are some of the potential roles of government in these, in these processes, mm -hmm. right? And so, <clears throat> A distillation of what I just heard, which, <clears throat> first of all, you gave an excellent presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, well, it, I hope it made sense. Yeah, if anyone it, has it, any questions, please ask. It did. And, you know, to our question is, it's not a computing power issue. It's more of a, like, how, what are you feeding into this system? Where is it coming from? To, to what degree can you trust it? Yes. And so, you know, bioinformatics are an area that touches on privacy. That's, that's a concern in some areas. But another is just maybe there's a way that, you know, government can kind of federate in providing that, that information to the system, be that trusted third party to feed the system. Um, because, you know, Vermont's gonna be a small population, so we're not gonna be able to give the system probably sufficient sampling of, of you know, genome types to really give you everything you want. So it'd be better if you had, like, and you know, at least a national, maybe a global sort of database of, you know. Uh, on the other hand, we can, you, you used a phrase about, you know, kind of small and proud or whatever, yeah. but there are small things, and mighty. small and mighty, but there are things you can try it on a small population like this and just kind of then demonstrate for others. Yeah, no. Can no, 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 no. Yeah, we, we, view our, we view ourselves kind of as, honestly, it's, it's one of the reasons I think we've been successful in this space is because it, it, it does feel kind of like a, a, a test kitchen where yeah. new models of reimbursement and thinking about healthcare spend and how we're using genomics and how we're going to, you know, it's been a really interesting space to do this. Yeah. Can I, uh, I guess this is a basic question. This is a complicated subject matter. Um, and some of the terminology is uh, not, I'm not sure that I'm getting right. Sure. But uh, basically, are we talking about the AI doing the interpretation or just bringing you more data in a more organized and better way for you to do it? And of course, you're interpreting your part of what leads to a diagnosis, uh, and you're only part of the that process of doing it. Are we talking about the IA stepping up and getting to the diagnosis phase? Are we talking about the AI? even getting further and getting to the treatment phase? So, so there, and, and I think there's, there, there's going to be an issue of scalability here. And I think in the foreseeable future, the immediate step and the gateway here in terms of clinical grade genomics is, is the first thing that you said, which is how do we apply that to more AI to more uniformly get the, all of it, the 
do a uniform search of the data of the data sources available out there, right? And this is where AI is not something we're just going to plug in. It has to be expertly informed because we want it to work for us, right? So it's where you take AI capabilities, you intersect that with the mind of the molecular pathologist doing the interpretation, and 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 you you train the system to facilitate that bottom part of the iceberg that I spoke about. Eventually, and this is this is going to be an, 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 a, almost like a crowdsource kind of, I don't know if I'm using that appropriately, but there are going to be enough people implementing AI at that baseline level that I just said, where we, we can then say, and, and what's happening now is there's more and more people doing clinical grade genomic interpretations. And so eventually, we are going to be, we have kind of like a learning knowledge base of interpretations. And I think once you get to that point, you can then take the AI, step it up potentially to, um, and, and, and be able to QC and QA it in terms of certain instances where the diagnosis may be actually facilitated by the AI. And then I think the, one of the next levels, and this may be happening in parallel, is you know AI to facilitate the triangulation of clinical grade genomic laboratory data, which is one element of how do you how do you triangulate that with other laboratory values? How do you triangulate that with physical signs and symptoms documented in the EHR to then actually refine what is happening clinically? So that's the clinical decision support, what you had said, maybe the treatment. So I think there's going to be potentially parts moving in parallel. Um, and I think that it's going to be implemented. And we're going to be training the system and constantly testing and quality control, quality assurance of the system to then scale it up to, to the levels you're talking about. And is this system something you're developing yourself? No. Or something you buy? This would be something that came from a vendor. We are definitely not going to be creating our own AI. And so, you're that I can foresee. Right. so you're describing the state of uh, available technology on the marketplace now. So when you talk about, you'll start with the uh, assembly of the uh, relevant inputs in all of the uh, papers or whatever it is about the particular uh, thing you're looking for. Yes. Then, uh, so that's the first vendor level. The next vendor level is, and then that uh, system will give you an interpretation. And the next vendor level is it will go into a diagnosis overall of other variables and then into the treatment. And those things don't yet exist. They do not yet exist clinically, in my opinion. I don't know of anyone who's really there yet. I do know that there are genomic laboratory operations, and you may hear like, oh, we're going to leverage Watson, right? And, and so, <laughs> right? And that, that, yeah, we're, and, we're our own worst enemy with the hype around that. Yeah, so I, think, so I think basically it's going to be a matter of, like, let's say IBM as, as a vendor, let's, you know, and I'll just say Philips, IBM, I don't know, I'm just, I don't really know the vendor space that well right now, but we are probably on the cusp of vendors coming in and talking to us about this is our system, this is what it can do, and we would have to vet does it align with what the needs are to, to, to scale Right, bringing clinical genomics to, to patients. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we would have to be continually training and testing that system. And it will be learning from us. So um, that's kind of the, I mean, and, and again, this is, I, I'm just, from my, from my kind of expertise in space, I'm just kind of envisioning where things are going. I'm, I'm not saying it's definitely going to happen, but that's how I would see it happening in our space. My observation is that you know it's still research, and we're trying you know as we try to productize it. I think that there's still a lot of overlap with research that's needed and hands-on expertise. Hey, can I ask a question that veers a little bit away from all this like specific technical stuff and yeah. uh, focuses more on people? Yes. So um, one of one of the sort of uh, tasks of this task force is to look at the benefits and risks of, of use of AI. And I'm curious if you could provide us with some specific examples of, of benefits for people, like some examples of an illness and how this technology will revolutionize diagnosis and treatment. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a second question, which you can weave in, but I'm going to ask it now, because okay. I know the way this group works, um, which is that um, 
who will have access to this technology and this treatment? Because you, I heard you throw in the word population health, and I heard you mention payment reform, and so I'm wondering how that all connects, is going to connect with the use of AI. So if you could just address it. Yes. Okay. okay. Sometimes I focus on the second question. Well, the first one was some specific <laughs> benefits. Right, um, right. And examples. Um, so specific, I mean, a specific benefits are, you know, there are plenty in, in our in our space as we're and we're not even sequencing the entire genome. We are sequencing a very small part of it. See, the field used to be molecular pathology, where you would maybe sequence one gene, and you wouldn't really sequence the whole gene. You might sequence just certain certain bases or certain parts of it, and because you knew that that's where the mutations were, and if they would be there or they wouldn't. And now we really are sequencing, like in this test that we're offering, we we're sequencing the, you know, full, except for intronic, there's certain regions of the gene that are expressed in humans, and, and we sequence all of those exons in 30 genes that are known to be, you know, um, clinically relevant and have clinical utility in, in cancer and cancer therapy. So um, I think that in this space, if you were doing a little dabbling, or anyone who has any, any experience, personal or indirect in this space, these reports come out with a lot of variance, changes of unknown significance, right? And, and, and so what, what does that mean, right? And, there's, and then there's some variance where there's certain labs out there Right, that are reporting variants as being actionable. You could do something with this. But they're really in the interpretation. Why the medical interpretation is so important is they're really not, it's, it's kind of an irresponsible interpretation because they're not making a distinction between we did this, you know, we found data about this variant in a, a cell line in a lab where someone dropped agent X on it and agent Y, and agent Y melted away the cancer cells. And they're saying, well, that's actionable in a human being. Actually, no, it's not, right? Because it hasn't been brought through clinical trials and actually, you know, so that's not an appropriate interpretation. And I think that how patients benefit from, so what we need to do is we need to say, okay, has this variant been biochemically um, characterized at baseline level, and what is it? You know, how, how do we know it acts? So, you know, in the in the molecular pathways, has it been then has it been tested in any way in human beings, and to what capacity? And then does it have you know professional like clinical guidelines associated with how to act on it? And what are the potential therapeutic you know uh, action points that you can take based on this variant? So there's a whole, I mean, if you think about it from the very beginning of like, do we know what it is? You know, has it been tested in the research realm? Has it been tested in clinical trials? Did it make it all the way to a professional guideline? And then what do you do with that, especially as you combine that information with the tumor type? Because that variant in tumor, you know, a GI tumor, a gastrointestinal tumor, might be different than what it means in a lung cancer. So, so I think to be able to get to that answer more quickly on us on us in a scalable way, I think that benefits a patient, right? Because it permits us to do a thorough clinical interpretation in, in a more efficient way. Um, and I think AI can assist there. So that's like a really kind of down-to-earth foreseeable benefit at the entry level in the clinical lab space. So it, oh, oh sorry. No, and then and then I think in terms of and that's the laboratory interpretation space. In the clinical realm, right, where you as a patient would come in and see your see your oncologist, um, you want to. It would be great if your physician can also then say, okay, this is what the genomic report says, and this is what the anatomic pathology report says, and this is what your radiology scan shows. And so, based on these elements and like your metastatic profile. This is, and, and, and your, your other comorbidities, right? This is what you would, these are the options for you. And so, so to facilitate that, and then that would allow a, a physician to have five, 10 more minutes to talk to you about the things you really want to talk about, right? Around, around besides just trying to get to an answer of what are your, what are your options. So I think those are real tangible benefits at the you know, entry level. Um, and then in terms of, we want to be able to offer this to 
any patient who would like to have it in our health network, right? And so, and so the more scalable you make this, as long as it's quality controlled, quality assured, and it's being delivered and used in a clinically responsible manner by professionals, then I think that it just allows us to touch that many more people who would like to access this. So I think I think that's the, I, I hope that answered your question. And if not, I'm happy to elaborate. It answers the question. It was, it, and I, I appreciate the level of detail you're giving us. If I have to simplify it, I'm going to ask a question. Sure. I'd be like, you're oversimplifying it. But like when I, when I hear what you're saying, it sounds like artificial intelligence could allow us to potentially cure all cancer someday. No. Okay, so then what? So then, <laughs> I, wish, I wish I could say yes. So, so I wish I could say yes to that. So how much of it? How much of it then? I, I, think, I think artificial intelligence implemented in a clinically responsible manner along you know in, in being used by the experts the clinical experts you know along along the the care of a patient i think can can facilitate a better patient experience clinical experience and i think it could alleviate physician burnout, potentially. I think it can, because it, it would facilitate what I think a lot of physicians got into healthcare to do, which is to be able to, instead of just rifling through random data points, actually spend time with the patient on the other side that they're there in the room with. Um, and I think that it would, it would also facilitate um, and more efficient matching of patients to therapeutic pathways that align with let's optimize your benefits from this and let's mitigate futile experiences in your cancer care or in your care. It doesn't have to be necessarily just in cancer. So optimize benefits, minimize futility. And again, that feeds back into the patient and physician experience and our experience with healthcare and, and our well-being. Um, and I think that, um, you know, in the end, it allows us to, in making those decisions for more and more patients, by allowing us to be more efficient clinically, um, it, it then ultimately indirectly facilitates probably a better, a better use of limited healthcare dollars. Because we're not just chasing, you know, futile pathways. We're not just running down futile pathways. So maybe you could bullet those points. That, that actually was really helpful when you went back through, and Good. I felt like you boiled it down to some some simpler things. Um, because because the way when you presented the way you report, it just sounded like like you know it was going to allow us to when you were talking about genomes and stuff, yeah. it sounded like the more information that is available, the more data available, and the better the AI gets, that the, the extrapolation I had from that was like, okay, inevitably, you know, as that technology progresses and we have more information, we're gonna be able to cure more and more things. So I didn't mean to make such a dramatic statement. No, 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 yeah. I, it, no, and I, and I think, you know, I do think what you just said is possible. I mean, ideally, I think genomic information, if patients, are informed and they want to, you know, have their physicians and themselves have access to their genomic information. It's a fundamental element, a fundamental kind of knowledge part of taking care of someone, just like they take your blood pressure or, you know, that height and weight, right? I mean, this is just fundamental information that makes each one of us unique. Um, and I think that the genome is a journey. It's not just a one-time snapshot necessarily, depending on what level of it you're looking at. And what we want to do ultimately is be able to implement that information, if patients want that, in their healthcare record, and, and leverage that to better treat patients over the course of their lives. What, your, what my genome says may not be actionable right now, but if I know 10 years from now, I'm at risk for X, I can better modify or I can be better educated 
to, to make choices if I want to potentially mitigate that. So, so I think we should be able, I think it's our responsibility to offer this to people. And, and again, I mean, there's going to be, you said a bunch about ethics, right? We are engaged at a very high level in a, with, with our ethics group. We are engaged with patients as we're moving forward with this. That's a very important piece. Um, so, so I hope that was helpful. Let me, in the interest of time, because we're now running out of the uh, schedule allotment, I'd like to give you an opportunity, Nikki, to sort of give your closing statements, recommendations, mm -hmm. talk. But I do want to see this because I didn't get a chance to ask a question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about the interpretations, right? That's one of, the, one of the most difficult parts, and this is where we do require the doctors and stuff like that. To have an AI uh, deal with that, I'm glad I hear things like quality assurance and stuff like that. Right. But I assume that's also a challenge to prevent the AI from being biased because you probably run into your into clinicians that might have biased interpretations. So that's not a question, but if you could feed that into sort of your recommendations, because one of the things uh, you and I discussed before is like, what does it mean on the on the personnel side to even understand potentially AI and be aware? So that's that's my uh, CD. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that. Um you know, I think I would like the committee to be, you know, to recognize the imperative to invest in and, and mandate the involvement of certified laboratory professionals and 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 the appropriate uh, clinical professionals in, in the implementation and ongoing management of the clinical use of, of AI uh, pertaining to genomic medicine. Um, you're absolutely correct, right? I mean, so the cancer care you might get here might be slightly different than the cancer care you're going to get at Memorial Sloan Kettering, than the cancer care you might get at, you know, the community, uh, you know, health center in Iowa. So uh, there are local differences in practice, but there are national guidelines. And so, so I think we need to train a system based on our own expertise, but also have this external training as well of the system and making sure that we're not deviating from, you know, national, we're meeting national benchmarks. There are ways to do that, um, I think, and, and I think that that should be a part of it. So that hopefully would mitigate bias. Um, and I think we need to, that needs to be part of the development and clinical implementation of this. Um, and I think, you know, to work with, you know, to not have, I think it's very important. I, I'm just, I'm honored to be here and be able to share my perspective with this group. Um, you know, the last thing we want is for people without the expertise to be mandating to us how to do it. I think we need to work together. I think that, you know, recognition um, and working with uh, professionals in our space that are going to be using and training this system um, to, to uh, understand the implementation and execution of, of the ongoing QC and QA uh, of AI in the health system is, is very important as well. So um, I, I think that's how I would, I would summarize some recommendations. So I'd like to So Nikki, uh, we're gonna we'll set up our second speaker. That's a child's going for her. You're welcome to take that. I do, I do, so thank you. So thank you, I just appreciate that.
Yeah, of course I love him. Yeah, I love him. Oh, I will. I will. During the break. Hey, congratulations. What did you hear? Did you make a decision? I heard. Did you do early decision? Uh, early action. Yeah. Did yeah. 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 we just do that? Who did you hear? Uh, no. Oh, you talked about this conversation. I remember that. But you, I didn't know that you had it. I'm sorry. speaker here, but healthcare has the finance portion, it has the preventative and the wellness. It also has a lot to do with diagnosis and treatment, and she alluded to that, Nikki alluded to that a little bit, but that's where we're seeing a lot of AI activity. Um, I'll just give some basic examples, and that might be helping a physician to actually diagnose a puzzling problem in front of them in a much more efficient way, and actually, Jean, to remove some of those biases that happen, um, of course you can introduce bias too. And, and there, are, there are a lot of sites that have been, or um, efforts that have been involved, probably since around 2010 on that, that have made some progress. So in our off session time, we can talk about some of that. But, um, so Charles Wells here has been with um, the organization, the, the um, hospital in Bennington for about 20 years, and focused a lot on some of the efficiencies in medicine the communication between staff, um, which can be very problematic and cause delays, and how to use AI and machine learning to improve those, to make sure the doctors and the nurses get the data that they need in the right time. So I'll turn it over to you. So thank you all for having me here, first of all. I really appreciate it. Exciting group. Um, the first thing I'm going to be talking about is not so much healthcare related, more like systems within my department, kind of in a vacuum a hole, and then slowly leading out into uh, more patient-related stuff. So um, I've been a developer at the hospital for many years, and um, you know we've always had the buzzword for the last few years of AI and machine learning, and couldn't see how we could really like utilize that. You know, there's large, like, there's Google AI and a lot of other and IBM large groups doing this, but at the time it's kind of like buzzwords. So something interesting has happened at our hospital. So we had a these are small little projects again right within my own department. Um, that started, but it's caused this exponential excitement about using ML. It's become kind of like the, the hammer, you know what I mean? And we see a lot of nails with all these issues and plain data, and we're kind of getting excited about it. So the first one I started out with, we have a uh, ticket database system for help desk tickets within our department, and there's like over 130,000 of these in there. And someone started to go through and classify each of these, because they wanted to know um, where we need to do some reporting and looking at different issues of what's going on. Um, we said, let's, you know, this is a great way for us to dip our toes into machine learning. Um, we're using the Microsoft ML. And the reason why we're doing the Microsoft ML is because 
unfortunately, and I'll talk about it after, we're in a silo right now where you know a lot of people are worried about because of HIPAA and HIPAA compliance and getting this data out into Google and you have to have you know a business associates agreement before you can even do anything and you're kind of stuck. So this allowed us to start small with not patient data at all. Um, internal with our system and it, the results were actually pretty amazing. We uh, built a training page that allowed our help desk staff and other IT staff to classify. Um, they really got into it because they started to see how well it was going to work and they trained up to 900 tickets. So they would classify it of its importance, was the patient related, um, and the, the type of issue it was. And since that, um, we have been able to go through all 130 tickets within seconds and classify, based on the training being updated, all of these documents, so all these reports. But from that, and we're using um, three different algorithms, we're using a stochastic, um, logistic regression, and n -base or naive bays together, and pulling from that which one pulls the most light, you know, um, the, whatever, where we have it based on the scoring. Which so one is the heavy? Have them in parallel and, and so we have them in parallel doing all three algorithms. Oh, and whatever scores the most, they, we use that as the classification. Oh, um, because we, we found that like naive base, which is it's hilarious because you know I've been programming all these years, not really using these algorithms. I looked them up and they've been used in like the 50s on um, like whiteboards and chalkboards and stuff. And it's, it's like this is amazing, but be having the um, Microsoft ML libraries available to allow a, you know, a mobile developer like me to tap into that, it's become really exciting and really neat. Um, so it's not a big deal that I have been using it in spam classification, but it's been really useful. So from that, um, we've also built this tracker board that we have throughout our department and other areas that are showing in real time what are the major issues. So it could be, as some of you maybe know, like uh, Citrix, it's also used for remoting. Um, if there's issues with a particular server with that, um, they can get alerts. They can also see that's the most problem area of that day. So it's exciting to see that you know people spend time training this like an infant, and it's actually shown up. So it's it's kind of neat to see this. So when this is happening, people are now coming to me, and um, it's change of mindset within the department and outside of what if we can do other things like this. So from that we did, all right, we have this ticket data. It's a great way to play. Um, we have on our help desk entry page when people are typing up the issue. We'll have it now, we set up a model, um, and this one we're just using Stochastic as the algorithm. It's going through all of the previous tickets every five minutes and building that model so we can use it. So as they're typing up what the issue is, we already predict where the ticket should go. And there's up to 30 different possibilities. A different person or a queue that should take care of the issue. Um, we're in Meditech Hospital, so there's um, you know, some Meditech analysts that it needs to go to but it's slightly different and may have to go to hardware. Um, it's, it, it's people they are saying, it, it's it, not even myself, because I'm letting the library just work on this, to build the model. And um, we're getting a 74% accuracy on our prediction, which is really exciting. Um, the other kind of neat thing that's come out of this is the help desk person filling out the form. It's actually picked up the writing style. So if they're closing the ticket themselves, Based on the writing style, it's picked that up and predicted that. Also, it's just kind of neat, little exciting thing. It's not earth shaking, but it's been incredibly useful. So Especially when you distinguish between the individual, which individual is doing. Yes, that. exactly. So, it's like if we have different help desk um, people and they're closing tickets themselves, it's already predicted that it already adds them because it knows it's closing. So it's that same kind of issue. So it's really it's like this living thing that you're kind of seeing working. Um, it's really exciting, and when you show people that, it's turned into a lot of other projects. What if it predicts incorrectly? What if they're not closing it? So what they, if they like, are writing and? <laughs> yeah, so if, yeah, if it's simple, it still comes up with the Microsoft ML. Um, we can do scoring, but we just let it, like the uh, algorithms they use, it just gives you data. So even if you have the tiniest model and it doesn't make sense, it still gives you the data. And what we're doing is I'm keeping track of what it predicted and what they actually changed it to. And that's how I get the 74%, which is, I mean, it's very small, but it's exciting to actually see that in this our little, small little organization. Um, from that, we are, um, in projects we're currently working on right now, is we have um, a home-built application. It's a Citrix client itself. 
that allows nurses to just use their fingerprint to log into a Citrix desktop that can go from a cow, which is a remote movable um, computer on wheels is what they call it. Um, and then, yeah, they call it the cow. It's Vermont, I thought it was a Vermont thing. So, <laughs> but we also have desktops. So the nurses use this desktop and we have um, a single sign-on bar that we have created for them to use a single sign-on. So at the same time, again, it's this whole mindset now of machine learning. Um, we're building models based on their activity in the morning because there is a slow login to the computer and in the morning, different nurses do different things and the applications they may be opening, it's not the fastest thing. It can take, by the time they're set up and ready to start to work, it's like a minute and a half. That's a lot of time that you add up over a few years even, that adds up. So we're building the uh, model that's tracking their activity, what they're doing, the window location, everything, so that when they come in the morning, we can initiate a process based on all their activity they've done the previous months or whatever, um, to automatically log them in so when they swipe in with their at the time clock by the time they get to their machine and lock, put their finger down their applications that they always use where they put them are automatically open and ready so we're building those models now and um, we're starting to test this and there's a lot of exciting because you, you get ready you're there you want to start entering data or looking up or you're just checking your email and time wasting just logging in Accessing the program is so nice to have that just up and ready. Um, the other, sorry, I'm speaking fast too. So I'm very, very <laughs> You're excited. <laughs> yes, I, it's, it's, this stuff is so You're exciting. Like uh, and, and based on that is, um, you know, going to Hims, which is a big health information um, conference, and you know, there's a buzzword. You know, you have uh, blockchain, you have um, AI and ML, and it's like they're being used, kind of like they, you know, on these big projects and big data. Um, you know, we have like small or medium data, and being able to utilize that is really cool. And something I want to also talk about after um, is open sourcing and working with smart folks like this gentleman over here on some future projects. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Okay, absolutely. So um, you were talking about the scenario you were describing with the nurse, you know, swiping a card. Yes. But are you have you measured any sort of um, you know, improvements in like, you know, time to patients in the, you know, in the office. Like, are there any kind of key performance metrics that you've No, we're that starting to build those now because, okay. because we have those data points when they're swiping in yeah. and when they try to access the program. We do know it's like a minute and a half before they're ready to enter in right. just because, you know, that Citrix program being slow like right. it is. Um, and any, that's the same thing why we implemented single sign-on. Anytime you're putting your password in, yeah. that, those few seconds, just add up yeah. a lot. And so having it, if you eliminate passwords for your nurses, it just it adds up. So this is a small little piece of ML, um, AI you could say, that we're tacking onto just to help them. But my point is, by us just starting with a small little tiny project, just kind of goofing around and seeing where it's going, we're looking at future projects now. Um, we're building, made it working with other people at the hospital um, on building models for prediction on census, but applying, I have you know, 10, 12 years of all of this data. We apply weather data with that for barometric and then events like holidays, um, precipitation. Um, apply that and try to validate and see how close and how accurate our prediction can be on census. Of course, it's not really exactly, there's so many things, but it's fun applying these different data sets to your own data to see where your outcomes could be. Um, I know of a spot where you were um, somewhat using measurements that you were asking for, mm -hmm. and that's your work with um, with interruptions and messaging. So one of the things that that we've been interested in is a nurse or a physician throughout a day, just like in all of our jobs, but this is healthcare, so like, <coughs> gets interrupted um, <coughs> you know, multiple times a minute, and so much of the interruption. I can't remember where our measurement was, but about seventy-five. 80% was not, um, certainly not emergent, not even really urgent, but they can't tell the difference. So they have to stop what they're doing with the patient and see, is this an emergent issue, urgent issue? And so some of the um, ML type stuff that we were at least talking about, I know you put in, is trying to predict, get the message to them, but how um, urgent is it? And be able to predict, I need to 
actually buzz, uh, you know, uh, buzz their apparatus and say, stop what you're doing and look at this, versus I'm going to ping you every once in a while to say, don't forget about something. So that would be a measurement. So then those are actually correlate to error, because the more you're interrupted, you know, the more errors occur in medicine. And that's also where there's times where it is important to go to that physician and you may not need that information right away. Like we've seen that with our lab critical data for years where it was going to two people. It was going to, so there'd be a critical error or a critical result. And um, that information would go to the lab tech would now, there's one person that would contact the nurse. Now, a nurse is trying to get a hold of the physician. We're finding those times are going from, it was like 56 minutes was the uh, median time. We now are just going directly to the physician. And here's the problem, is coming up and you, but utilizing that data on what is really important, but also what is the physician doing about that after, and how can you track that? So, um, but anyhow, back to that, we've gone to like seven minutes for that time. And that's the thing is we have all of this data, lots of data, and it's in a silo. And that's probably a frustration of like what we talked about before is it's in a silo. And I would love to see a way where, um, I, you know, and Trey was telling me about this, the task force here, um, you know, there's, there's talks of, uh, you know, where things are going in here, but I look at it as the excitement thing of what, what about collaboration to push it forward to, you know, get this data in like Milo's hands safely. And yeah, so that's the question. So one of the things that medical data is particularly hard is that because of legitimate privacy issues and also some, I don't want to call it greed, applied greed, you know, the medical companies don't want to share, the hospitals don't want to share, what, what could we do to be prescriptive to say, you know, you could put some sort of anonymized data out? What would be that's the same? What does the state do to make that easier? That's exactly what I have here. Now we have certain things called meaningful use. I don't know if a lot of people Know, you know about meaningful use is required with CMS. You have to put out um, certain things with your informatic. You have to um, have certain interfaces with like um, patient. patient portal. You have to have, I would love to see, now the hospital has, um, you know, Vital, the Vital program, which has tons of data. Our insurance companies here have tons of claims data. Um, I would like to see, even like the smaller hospitals, because I think that data is important. I really feel it is. Um, I would like to see some, here's my dream, is having a standardized data set that has no patient identifiable information. Um, a, a very large data set, almost like a CCR, or um, which is used to you know, share between portals and everything else. But I would love to see a large data set where some data scientists you know, in this state could get their hands on. Because what I found out, kind of what I talked about in the beginning, is what I've learned with machine learning is you don't know out of the gate what you want to do with it yet unless you discover things with what the data is doing. And I think until you have that data, you don't know what can come of it. You know what I mean? Um, so you, you mentioned vital, which I don't know, not everybody here is familiar with what that is. Um, so it's Vermont, um, it's, it's an acronym for Vermont Information Technology Leaders, but what their mission is, is to essentially aggregate uh, healthcare claims data, um, you know, um, incident data, to kind of create sort of uh, s reporting the snapshots to the hospitals. Is it a state entity? It's, it's a, they're a partnership with the state, so I think it's funded, um, by, the it's funded by the state. It's funded by the state, oh, okay. but it's but it's not state employees doing the work because right. there's an expertise needed. Um, right, but they have this incredible amount of data. Yeah. The same thing you when within our own silo we have a lot of this, you know, vanilla data. Is it connected to the to individuals? It, 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 it is connected to individuals, but one of their problems that they've had. So um, there's a prescriptive way to look at data problems and there's a descriptive way to look at data problems. And the prescriptive way to look at when I say prescriptive, I mean that you know the data would have a predefined scheme in our taxonomy and we have to identify you know which field you know lets us know uh, is the primary key so that we know that we don't have multiples of people and things like that right then there's a descriptive way of looking at things so let's just throw it all together ask sort of more natural language questions of it and then determine you know uh, you know get the information we want from it so 
Vital, I think, in their reports have said that they struggle because they've got essentially more individuals than we have individuals in the state in, in their record set. So deduplication is an issue for them, right? So applying some form of heuristic machine learning or AI to help them sort of, you know, amalgamate and create a, a new composite descriptive version of a person, I think is kind of what you would need. Right. Yeah. And, and, but I, and that's the thing, is, is getting the hands on the data. Like um, right. the former CEO of Google at the HIMSS conference, healthcare related, was just like, give us your data. <laughs> so it's like, just, be, just give it, it's safe, but it's hard to <laughs> give yes. that up. You can't, you know what I mean? So, but I would like to see, as far as like a recommendation is, looking at like a byproduct of this task force maybe, I don't know, is collaborating. I've already learned about a few amazing people here already just sitting there. Um, that would be amazing to collaborate and use their knowledge. And again, it's hard to say, I can see where data scientists would come up and say, well, what do you want us to do? Right. And like, we have all this data. I don't know what I want to do. But let's see what comes of it. Like, um, for instance, we have someone in our department, we're starting to get the concept wrapping around how to build a model on all of this one care data mm -hmm. that we have. And how, all right, it's plain data. There's only so much you can do when you import it into Excel. Like, how can you use machine learning? Like, the things that we saw when doing the tickets, these, um, it's, again, it's this magical, cool things that are happening with it. How can you apply it? So, so uh, State has a data sharing platform right now. It's, uh, if you go to data.vermont.gov, they use a Socratic platform oh, where, yeah. where, where data sets that are, you know, mm -hmm. to, to ease transparency as well as just feed innovation out there. Um, data sets are published, but they're essentially static data sets, right? So there is a, there's a modernization pro project underway right now to take that and maybe turn it, give it capabilities where real-time data could also be fed through that. Yeah. that that's where like Vital or yeah. like these other um, clearinghouses like Kixney that we, you're, you're required to use yeah. for, um, for meaningful use. So why not? Get the you know those data scientists connected yeah. together with our healthcare data, science, to to discover new neat things that come out of it because you don't know I don't think 100 percent all the time until you start playing with the data. It's pretty right. exciting. Yeah, I think you raise a really good point there in that it really is an iterative process of discovery. You know, you basically you build, learn, fix, build, learn, fix, and you eventually improve sort of. Right. You know, and that's really what AI is, it's what machine learning is, but it's also kind of what we should expect of our use of these technologies to be that kind right. of process. Mm -hmm. and, point. and also like the, um, the fear of use, obviously before like, you know, as we're getting closer to more patient care things we're doing, I mean, by next year at this time, I'm hoping we are working with that data or working with other outside folks on building something. Um, the big thing is obviously, and Nikki mentioned it too, is trusting that data. It's the same thing as, um, and you also have to test. And that's what we did even with our small, tiny little project with the ticket classification <laughs> and prediction. It's tested, just like a child, as you're teaching it and it's learning, you also <laughs> test it at times too to make sure it's validity. Um, as far as where it comes down to healthcare, regulations or things like that, that's a whole nother, again, you don't know what's coming out of it. There's very specific things like the genome project that's obvious. But um, I, I think it's good to also be aware of what healthcare um, uh, thing projects are being done using ML and AI that could be shared, but also just keep tabs on is what I think the focus of this group on is also. Thank you. So. Charles, uh, a slightly different question, all those sort of related. So you're you're in a nice position where you're building ground up using AI and organization mm -hmm. terms. And so one of the questions that, you know, we're involving the human folks inside. Uh, do you have any, you know, stories or anecdotes to account about, you know, what the reception is in terms of like the doctors and both positive and negative? Is there something you, you thought about how to have in place as part of your validation? So, I mean, a, a simple yeah. example is like yeah. your system decides that I'm going to recommend you interrupt this doctor right now and but they're in the middle of brain surgery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's all right. We're fortunate that in our small environment, um, working with some of these physicians like Trey and some others, that it's so small that you know, it's one of those you meet in the hallways or have a quick chat with 
Um, and they're very receptive and very exciting. Like our group at our hospital, we have some of the most technically advanced um, physicians. It's really wonderful. Um, they give a lot of insight and they've actually helped build um, the um, acknowledgement system. With their, and I still have a giant list that, of their recommendations that need to be implemented. But, um, I, and I think that's where I'm very fortunate at the smaller hospital and have such great receptive physicians like Trey on um, uh, working with them on that. And that's. I was just probably thinking about, you know, you know, maybe down the line, one of the things that, it, you know, if we were going to talk about scale also in there is the processes that you learn. You know, one of the things that if you went back to, it said you're training a child system. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the futures that come along for, especially more transparency? I think a lot of your technology that you're building right now is really cool. It's falling under the dream of the personal assistant. You know? yeah, and good. I don't know, I'm probably dating myself, but probably a number of you remember Clippy in Microsoft. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and how ruthless that was. <laughs> yeah, exactly. but, yeah, and, but, but it's, yeah. it's the dream of having that available. You know? What's interesting, though, on that is that we all do, how many of you have like uh, Alexa or Google Home? I mean, that stuff has progressed to the point that it's now part of all of our lives. And it's really interesting to see how that is not pervaded into the surgical theater or something like that. And it, it, it is a little bit. It's called decision support. Yeah. Um, and what it does is it helps um, talk about checks and balances. So for example, if I see a patient and I see their diagnoses, I can actually enter them into a system that comes back with um, some differentials and tries to sort of make sure that I'm covering everything and not having a bias maybe that might be up in is there. It is it is interactive as one of these like No, it'd be great for it to be there. Yeah, right now it's very it's very manual. Yeah, yeah. That's so what I was thinking. Like, so the way it becomes more interactive is um, hopefully it's starting to pull from the electronic medical record some of the stuff that Chuck's doing and um, and start <coughs> hitting me up as I'm actually involved in the care and say, I mean not ridiculous but I noticed you didn't order this particular lab. Would you be interested in doing that? And it's not quite true. And that's the thing with some of these things like that are in there. And you know what? They you could call them, you know, AI. It's uh, built on a million if statements and Boolean logic. Um, and yeah, that, that is in a way. But when I first, you know, for 20 years programming, see that little library from Microsoft that's for free, applying these 1950s algorithm against that data that we built and trained, it was really, really exciting. So, um, yeah. Well, uh, uh, question, to what extent is, so I, I think I got what you're doing at Southwestern uh, uh, Healthcare. Um, so what is, is that shareable? Is it required to be shared around if somebody wants it? Um, it's good for a small and medium sized healthcare facility of, the, of, of like that. Um, is that uh, I, I understand you're talking to each other, but does the system have anything that says, gee, when there's this kind of improvement, it helps the operation? Uh, in uh, Bennington County, we want to be sure it goes to other yeah. counties that can use it. So, and, and that's exactly like what I was pointing on. I, the collaboration. I would love to see happen. So there is focus a No, right. And I would love to, you know, network with other people um, that are doing that or trying to advance AI, especially in the healthcare. Um, and get are, to are you unique in the answer to this question? Is it everybody trying to do it, and you just are giving you your example? I don't know. I, or are most people not? Doing it? I honestly, I think um, I have the uh, very fortunate um, position that I can do development at the hospital and working with them, because I also have a side business and I work with other uh, smaller hospitals of our size, and they don't have like a, like a programmer working on these things. They're using the best of breed programs that they can purchase from vendors. Um, you know, and we do a lot of homegrown applications to suit um, our small, medium-sized hospital. Um, and that's where I want to advance that so we can share and open source some of these things, like these discoveries, for even like this, the help desk take a classification and that would be something great to um, outsource so other places, not even healthcare related, could use something like that. But that's an answer my CIO <laughs> has to decide on doing something like that. Um, I like to, but my big point is sharing our data that we have that protects the patient, that you know, it's filtered out or obfuscated in a way 
that's useful for data scientists, I think is very important. And if we can do that and work with other people, they can also go out with other programs. And I'm not saying make it mandatory, like meaningful use, it's just the point of um, they can do that. That can help that smaller hospital um, utilize that information. So, no, no, I'm not repeating myself. So. <laughs> So why don't we go ahead and give us your final recommendations? Um, yeah, I think you know, I, I think I encourage um, organizations not to keep that data in silos and work with really smart people, um, especially in Vermont, because it's unbelievable. The um, it's just kind of feels to me being in southern Vermont will spread out in more brilliant different areas, but. Um, collaborating and working with them. And as far as the recommendation of this group, I would I, I don't know what that looks like to help that today for me being here and uh, meeting some people. I think that was a big part of that too. Good byproduct of it. So um, that's it at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's, it's, it's not all doom and gloom. Hey, uh, <laughs> no, no, Do we want to take a five minute break, break and then we yeah. just get on time? Well, thank you. We're only 20 minutes. I'm going to be here next year. Five minutes. 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 Five
Um, there are a couple of uh, examples that I want to give, and I think they are um, going to be, you know, uh, um, things that will help us to go to um, AI. And the first one is uh, a system that has been used in, in, in practice uh, for many years now, and uh, that's in cervix cancer prevention, or what we know it as pap smear screening. And so uh, pap smear screening uh, was introduced since the 1940s, and in the developed countries, the, the rich countries, it has saved a lot of, a lot of life, uh, lives. Uh, so in Northern America and Western Europe, cervix cancer is uh, not seen very often. In our practice, we see it maybe once in two weeks or so. But when I travel to Africa and uh, I go to a small town um, and see one of my friends, clinicians, they oh, I had three or four, this would be what they tell me. Because they don't have screening. And what that, what that screening does is we catch it as precancerous lesion. So the way we do it uh, currently is, uh, or previously is, um, a cytotechnologist who is an expert technologist reviews a slide which comes from a patient and finds this precancerous lesion. And when she finds that, she gives to me as, a, as an MD, and I review it, confirm the diagnosis, and we send it up. But fortunately, in this country, most of the results are negative. Or, uh, but each slide has about five to 10,000 cells to be reviewed. So the cytotechnologist has to review those cells and if it's deemed normal, a report is issued. It doesn't even come to me. Um, so in two, uh, about 20 years ago, they started developing this uh, system that has algorithm. It's not AI, but you know, you tell them. So, so an abnormal cell or a precancer cell is a cell that has large nucleus, if you remember from high school. Uh, and it's dark, and the nucleus uh, membrane cover is irregular. So those are uh, some of the features, but there are more features that we look at to call it precancer. <laughs> and when we decide it's a precancer, it goes to the surgeon, uh, to the surgeon, and that area is removed before it becomes full-blown cancer. So. About 20 or 15 to 20 years ago, um, a company called Ologic, Ologic um, has developed this algorithm to look at those features. And then, you know, they have that system. And so you put the slides the night before, let's say 100 slides, it reviews all the slides, marks about 22 most abnormal cells, and then, um, and they are marked by the X and Y axis. So the next day, the cytotechnologist comes and puts the slide in a special microscope. And it takes him or her into those 22 abnormal cells, or the most abnormal cells. If she deems that these cells are not abnormal, then they are gone she gets to review only 22 cells. If within the 22 cells she finds abnormality, then I should review the whole slide, and then comes to me, and I, I make a judgment, and make a diagnosis of maybe precancer or a little cancer. So this has saved a lot of time uh, for the cytotechnologist and increased efficiency, and in preclinical setting, they found out that this was not inferior to when it's reviewed by the cytotechnologist. So it's at least equal, if not better. Actually, they, you know, publications that showed 
then and continue to show is that we find more precancers using this system. So, but only for the efficiency was enough to. to so, uh, University of Vermont Medical Center has introduced this system in 2005. So we've been using it since. Uh, it's working. <coughs> of course, this is not an AI. Uh, it's just you give it an algorithm and it's just looking for those things. But it's digital, and that data can be stored, and then you know the deep learning and all that other people have uh, spoken about that can be exploited. So this is one example. Um, the second example that I have is what we call this whole slide imaging. So as, as a breast cancer pathologist, the radiologist looks at a, a mammogram and they find a mass, they do a biopsy, they send it to us. Pathologists, is, we make slides out of those biopsies. And my uh, role is to say this is cancer, it's not cancer. The way I do that is by pattern recognition. Again, I look at the cells and say, are these cancer cells or not? And almost always I have uh, training, a, a physician who becomes, uh, who is trained to become a pathologist who is what we call double head. You know, I have a microscope that has two double heads and we're looking at the same thing. So we're training them to show them the pattern again, to recognize the pattern, so pattern recognition. So, similar to what I told you earlier with the pap smear, uh, they now have this, what we call whole slide image, imager. You put the slide, it images the entire slide at high magnification and with um, high resolution. So, instead of looking uh, through the microscope, I can look at it, you know, in, Using, using my um, monitor on computer. And it's usually kept on the cloud, those images, and you can pick them and look at them. Which is great, uh, especially if I want to be in Florida at this time of the year, and just, uh, I don't need a microscope. I can make diagnosis for me. Uh, and what's more, I can, you know, uh, three, four people can look at one thing at a time and discuss. And you can have experts from uh, far away look at those things and, you know, what we call consensus diagnosis we can create, which is great. <coughs> um, so now my microscope, as I told you, is analog, of course, and this is digital image, which can be stored uh, and, again, exploited for pattern recognition and for big data. And as uh, Nikki was saying, and others have uh, said, you can use those data to, to uh, along with you know, genomic data, along with clinical uh, data, and you know, the computers can learn and you can create big data for deep learning. Uh, this is at the beginning. So this system, uh, this whole slide imaging system, most of it is in on a research basis. Only one system have been, has been approved by FDA um, about a year ago. By, it's from Phillips. Um, so not many people use it yet for diagnostic purposes. Uh, but in research basis, on a research basis, a lot of people are using it, including myself. I have a grant of, uh, to, to look at you know, the, the uh, concordance of a pathologist looking at a case and this by whole slide imaging. We have a system. So we'll see how all that works. But others have proven that this is uh, good enough, uh, good or better sometimes. Uh, so this FDA approved system is 
here, and other companies are working on having their systems FDA approved. And so what I think will happen in a decade or so is a lot of pathologists are going to start using this. And if we um, <coughs> exploit these things along with the clinical data, along with genomic data, I think it will be helpful. What I didn't mention earlier is when I have a biopsy, I call it cancer, no cancer. Once I call it cancer, I can decide uh, does it look aggressive or not. And I can even go further and say, well, if I do this special test, I can tell is it going to respond to a specific treatment. So we do that now. Uh, but imagine having all that data and uh, com combining it with clinical outcomes, um, how much work we, we would be able to give. Uh, um, so that's, those are the two examples that I have I wanted to share with you. Um, and now I'm available for questions. Yes. Question, as you know by my introduction, the legal system thing interests me. So <laughs> this is going to work, this raises, I know, a, a lot of questions about legal responsibility. So let me start with the slide analysis. So the machine looks at the slide, identifies no reason to look at it again. It's not looked at again. Uh, where does responsibility lie in, in that situation? Are you responsible by, because of the machine, or is the machine and its manufacturer responsible? I'm a patient who it missed a cell it should have seen. Uh, I want some uh, relief from what, what occurred to me. Where should I be able to see it? Uh, actually, that's a very good question uh, <laughs> because uh, it's one of the things that we uh, think about, about those false light imagers. Um, so here are the data that we know. Um, about 2% of the cases don't get scanned very well. So we'll have to look at them. QA or QC, like you from a see. mechanical problem, like they just something in the process. Uh, a variety of things. There's, you see, the slides are made by humans, and there are artifacts. So the good thing is that they are getting better and better because they are making them better and finding out. So the but, so the problem is in the slide creation, not in the horologic. Uh, examination of the pre-existing slide. Right, most of it is because of uh, technical human uh, stuff. But the other thing, uh, now that's the the pap smear review yeah. that has been um, uh, adjudicated a long time ago, and uh, um, false slide image is what I was talking about, the 2%. And um, what I said you were right is um, if there is a small tissue on the slide, that machine may not recognize it. And that smaller piece may be the diagnostic piece of, to call it cancer or no cancer. So those still exist. This issue still exists. And they are working on, on um, uh, adjudicating those. But I could miss that small piece as well, looking at it under the microscope. Uh, so all in all, I, I think you know, res the research shows that there is no inferiority. You know, what actually maybe as a human, I may make more errors than Those, those computers. So another hypothetical about the future, and I'm interested in what the human dynamic really is. So um, a, a, imagine a system that's going to make a diagnosis of cancer, not the one that you're making, and recommend that diagnosis to you. 
and you're going to look at it and say, well, frankly, I don't agree, and I'm going to put it in the non, no, no cancer side. It turns out you're wrong, and the machine is right. Uh, slowly by output. I mean, whether you're wrong or not, diagnostically, I don't know. All I know is that it turned out there was cancer. Um, and uh, uh, is that <coughs> In other words, as a patient, do I know that you didn't accept the recommendation of the system? And who's responsible? I'm back to responsibility. <laughs> Whose responsibility is the outcome? Right. Uh, again, very good question, which I will not be able to answer to you because these are early days, and um, those things have to be, um, uh, you know, taken care of by, by you know, uh, people like yourself and, and agencies that are responsible for that. But having said that, I, you know, as you know, uh, when a person gets cancer diagnosis, they usually uh, ask for a second opinion, and, and sometimes you know I get a as a second opinion. I don't. I may not agree. Um, usually it's not cancer no cancer, but you know maybe I may think it's uh, it's more aggressive than that they told out there. Um, so that exists, but the regulatory aspects of what you asked me, I think, have to be. Uh, so, so I pose it kind of as a human question because the question I'm trying to get at is that if you see that the system diagnose cancer, will you be very reluctant to diagnose no cancer? Because, you know, it diagnoses cancer, it goes forward, there's treatment or not in the process later on. Uh, whereas if you're the one saying there's no further examination or treatment, except the same opinion as you say, uh, will you feel, gee, I'd rather not make a diagnosis like that? Um, so would you be biased to not bet against the machine? You bet against the machine right. if the machine said cancer. Well, we, already, we already have analogies that we can't really do in medicine. Like we have these EKG machines that will diagnose a, a, a heart attack. But when the physician looks at it, and we're pretty used to that. And our radiology is trying to do the same thing in the studies. Yeah, and, and this is not a one person kind of you know uh, game anyways. Uh, if I have a, a difficult case, I have difficult cases every day where I would think you know is it aggressive or not aggressive. Even sometimes is it cancer or not cancer. So we have what we call consensus conference. Like ten people sit and we show it to, to each other and we look at it and we come up with consensus diagnosis. So. There is no black and white, uh, unfortunately, in, in what I do. So there are um, more gray areas. And so, yeah, in that case, I would show it to my colleagues and ask for uh, other, other people to see what they think. And we just have to come up with the best that we talk it is. Just to follow up on that point, one thing that occurs to me is that you know when we talk about you know do you trust the system, you know, we've had those discussions in the past task force. But this one actually might highlight the element that in the profession there's the entire ethos that's already built around it. So there's the legal side would be you know, malpractice and put the laws and adjudication on that is but the other side is the ethos like you were just describing is that that's why you go and look for other opinions. That's why you have confidence is the wrong word, but you, you, you have the authority to overrule what the machine is saying, or even overrule the top expert in the world, because they're going to be wrong sometime too. Yeah. So <coughs> AI ends up having a play in those, but I don't think there's rarely ever any discussion about AI within those particular ethos, which I think that's part of the human aspect that you're trying to bring up to. And it, it, it also may be that obviously AI is to some degree scaring people, and they might say, back to us on in this kind of application, us being what we would recommend. Well, maybe there ought to be a law that says you've got to get a second opinion or something in here as a baseline regulatory requirement. We don't generally have those. Um, you know, I don't know that I would have 
even thought of it outside of this context that AI is a, is a bit scary at the moment. Uh, Although that's actually, sorry, this might diverge a little bit. But interesting thing like, you know, the uh, medical system in other countries, you know, and I think like it's in different places in Asia, there's only one opinion. You don't go to anybody else. And so when you talk about the regulatory things of, you know, having people seek a second opinion, that's, I think these are all, um, yeah, and, and I think, you know, systems like this will alleviate things like this, uh, that experts will be available somewhere and you can have your cases reviewed by two experts. Uh, and, and I think there is a huge benefit to, to this as it exists right now and, and, and as potential AI data later on as well. Uh, I agree with you, in many countries you don't have to have this. Not only you don't have you, know, you have only one. Sort of, I think you sort of touched on it, but I work uh, for IBM and we have a bunch of health uh, stuff out there, and we're finding that it's, it's a hard problem. And even recognition is one of the easier problems, but even there, um, it, it, it's a really hard audience to sell into because we're still learning, right? And, and whatever expectation you put, whatever hype you put on it, you know, there's People out there are going to say, "Ah, oh, that didn't work," you know, or they made a bad diagnosis, as you know, people do all the time. It's a very strange startup. So I guess my question is, is, what's the path that you see in terms of as, as people start to bring in new tools, new AIs? How do you, how do, what is, what can we do to make it easier for the you know doctors and other health professionals to sort of accept the AI and train it and there's, there seems to be quite little patience, patience in, in, in new technology. In the moment that it doesn't perform perfectly, you know, they want to throw it out. So I think this is an issue with AI in every discipline. It's not just health. That you know, we expect it to be perfect from the beginning, and AI by its nature only gets perfect with use. And I find that to be a really uh, an issue. I'm wondering, is there something we could do locally to incent people to try it? Yeah, uh, I, I agree with you. It's like a self-driving car. No? That's a perfect. You know, yeah. you you, uh, you many people kill many people every day, but once it happens with self-driving car, and you know, it was almost. Uh, and you never get to see the number of people who are saved who, who don't right. get in that situation. So it's the same. So that's the same analogy, and and um, I think the one thing we can do is. You know, do proper research, more research, with uh, you know showing the benefits of, of uh, AI. Uh, not only showing that it is equivalent, but as a with a driving self driving car, show the benefits uh, of, of of those things. I know it's going to be slow, and there are regulatory issues, you know, like HIPAA and other things that go with that as well. Uh, but I, I think it's going to be a slow uh, build up of trust uh, among not just, uh, you know, uh, regulatory patients, but even physicians and, and people in the, in the field. Have, have uh, you know questions which are which is good I think to, to question and make it better and better, uh, but I hope at some point uh, this, which I think are going to be beneficial, will will uh, uh, be you know available for for people. So in some of the other testimonies we've had uh, throughout the months, we talked a little bit about how. Um, it may not be perfect, but it, it, it frees resources for other things as well, right? So if there's a physician's shortage in a particular area, are there, are there particular areas of medicine that you see it could be more helpful just because it does 
address these you know, resource shortage and such? Well, up in my field, uh, as I told you earlier, you know, uh, um, there are places even in the United States where you don't have um, the proper expertise of making a diagnosis, a proper diagnosis, or right. a good diagnosis. And even having a whole slide image, and just the image, forget about the AI, is very, very helpful to, yeah. to have access to, a, to an expert uh, who lives maybe in Australia, you know. Um, but it, when you add AI to it, I, I think that's going to be uh, really beneficial to a lot of people who do not have access to, to healthcare. Um, not just in the United States, I'm thinking, but throughout the world. You know. So we can maybe you should start to look at are there specialties that are in such short supply that you know AI can be more beneficial? Are there geographic locations that are so <coughs> underserved that AI can be you know similar, similar to like the driving scenario, right? Like you may not trust a self-driving car, but you probably trust it a lot better than you know someone who's driving intoxicated. So right. <laughs> The, the, one thing about the comparison is the self-driving car is actually three alternatives, although we think about these discussions too. One is totally self-driving, right. uh, totally driven. Uh, in the middle is all that technology helping the driver sure. do a better job. That is a, a better drived car that slams on the brakes before you do, um, and almost shows a, a, a whatever. And in fact, we have that now for numerous of them, only they're getting better, obviously. Here, you're largely talking about only that alternative of the uh, machine helping the ultimate human being to make the right decision in general. So it's the intermediate, not the totally autonomous, totally self-driving uh, alternative uh, that's like comparison. Except for that first example, which I had never heard before, that is the negative slide that doesn't go to anybody else after that, which is still fascinating. But in that respect, would, uh, it seems to me that there would be able to way to set up, uh, this is the researcher in me, a system that might be able to, to test the two situations where we can't do that with a self-driving car because you don't know how many lives it saves to have self-driving cars on the road. But in this case, there must already be some statistics on how many things currently got misdiagnosed by human, right, with the older system, and now that these things are coming online, I would expect that if the machine tells you that there might be an anomaly here, you're probably taking a better look at the situation because you don't want to go against that recommendation. So it, it seems like it opens up an opportunity to actually now to a test case and actually test yeah. and whether the statistics are different after this technology comes online. Big ethical question, like how the control group? Yeah, exactly. You get the when you said you had a data set of pattern recognition, and that's what my students do, I'm going to come to you at UBM and see if we can yeah, do some sort of test like that. I think, you know, the, the systems before, they, for example, that system, the whole slide image system from Philips, before it got FDA approved, it went through a really uh, rigorous, rigorous uh, study. The things that they required them to do before they uh, approved it, it is really a lot of work. And do, uh, do you have to tell the patient that the machine uh, said that there might be a problem, but this is what we think, such that the patient could then say, well, maybe I'd like more tests? Or... So that, that's a, a good question again. Uh, so we, we have the QA, QC measures in all uh, tests that we do, and this is no exception. So we take it as one of the tests, and we do you know, check a certain number or, and so there are a list of things that we do. Uh, telling the patient that uh, your, your tissue was scanned by uh, machine and then looked at by a pathologist. I don't think that is one of the recommendations, but that's a really a good... Uh, and I don't even mean having to tell them what it was scanned, because I probably wouldn't even know what it had done to me, and right. I don't know how it's, the process was. 
But I'm just saying that if a, if, a, if something did signal that there might have been an abnormality, but then you decide later that no, there isn't, do you tell the patient that, well, there's some indication that something might have been wrong, but you don't think so? That's information I would want. Yeah. So I, I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, the physician would be the final arbiter. I would think in those cases, um, as, as was said earlier, uh, because in, in the you know the EKG case, uh, because sometimes if you start those cascades, uh, it, yeah. it may get you know really even more confusing to to patients than. Uh, Beneficial, you know. Yeah, and similar, do you, when you find out that the diagnosis was wrong either way, do you feed it back to the system? Because I think that, that yeah. piece of information in terms of, you know, retraining and evolving, uh, it may be really, I mean, the, those miscompares are the most important thing. And oftentimes, uh, my experience is that they just get told they don't and go, you know, it gave the wrong diagnosis, <coughs> they don't know exactly when. Right. That's part of the learning. So somehow, in, some some mechanism. For that. Right. So in the lab, we have a QA matrix. Anything anywhere goes wrong, it's recorded, and we, you know, record it why it happened, and we want to uh, um, kind of solve that for the next. So. This system has not been implemented, not this, uh, the first system, but the second, the whole slide image. We don't use it yet, but if, when we use it and there are some errors, those errors we will uh, identify and uh, try to correct them. But again, remember, this is not AI yet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if it was, then it would learn actually from what it did wrong, even. Uh, you know, by feeding it or somehow. Um, yeah, it's that somehow. I think that a human can go, oh, I'm not going to do that again. But learning out how to you know, add to a training set that says, you know, what is the essence of this? Or, you know, sometimes it would require quite a bit of explanation for it to be able to learn. To learn. It doesn't learn like we learn. Mm -hmm. Like I can tell you, oh, don't do that again. It really is a matter of annotating the training sets. And that, that's integration of two different disciplines and right. somehow having, having those two communities be able to understand each other. Brian? Yeah, so last question. Oh, sorry. It kind of, it's kind of like a variation of your question, but because I didn't necessarily, it, it, anyway, I'm going to ask. It's a variation of, of Donald's question, but as artificial intelligence plays more of a decision-making role in testing, how might that impact the way that we handle informed consent with patients? You know, and, and as more control shifts from the human to the machine, you know, how might that affect? Because I mean, now, you know, do you explain to them every step of a test, or do you just say we're going to do the test? And, you know, when the steps of those tests become, when the, when the, uh, the sort of responsibility gets shifted from the human to machine, is it going to change how we talk about that? Right, so uh, currently we don't tell them what we do with their specimens most of the time, as you have explained. Yeah. There are a ton of things what we do, yeah. and we don't tell them because what we get is from the clinician, we get that test ordered, we do the test and send the result. What is done in that lock box for you, yeah. it is uh, not. Fortunately, there are regulatory bodies who uh, regulate this part of uh, it. So, and those are government agencies and other, or you know, uh, the societies that have been given by the government agencies to control those things. So that would be there again. And so, if if there is a, a system, then that has to be, a, you know. First of all, regulated and approved by FDA, and continuously, um, you know, checked as we do with our, our tests, and that will be the consent. And there will not. What I think is that there shouldn't be uh, there shouldn't be a need for consent for every test unless we use it for research, which we have.
Does that answer your question? Yeah, well, Peter, uh, what I'm hearing from you is that there's mechanisms in place that currently regulate and monitor the processes, and that, and so there's no need for additional consent because we can trust those processes, and that you would expect that as the technology progresses, that those institutions that are in place will continue to do their work. Absolutely. Yeah, like with the tests we do now, I think um, there will be an upfront, uh, you know, regulatory body, FDA, and other things that they will um, make it uh, so that it's not necessary to get consent from each person, which I think will, will make it really hard for, you know, uh, it's more paper than that. So, John ask the yeah. last question. You said that as to the second, the ones that do use AI, that uh, uh, there has been now one proof, approved system, I think you said Phillips, whatever it is. So this switches me to the economics question. Uh, as you indicate, uh, this is technology that can make your uh, work easier and more accurate. Uh, more convenient, uh, whatever. Um, how do you go about the decision of deciding to buy AI? Who makes that decision? How is that decision actually implemented? When do you say, I want that technology? Where do you put it on So, um, for everything that we do, even currently, want to have a uh, you know, mission with bells and whistles, which I like. You know, I go to a meeting and I see it, and I come and I say to the lab manager, hey, this looks great, let's have it. This is not AI, it's something else. They will say, okay, let's look at it. How much does it cost? What does it do? So there are so many things you have to go through, through the hoops and look at the benefits and the risks as far as costs, and all that, that has, has to be looked at like everything else, I think, before you implement anything. Especially the risk to the patient. We always are uh, you know, uh, cognizant about that. So we, we look at that's what we will have. It has to go through the steps that we do for other things currently. So last uh, final recommendation. Um, I, I think by different <coughs> from what uh, my colleagues have uh, spoken before, I think this thing is not going away. Uh, so uh, because it's not going away, we may as well kind of um, uh, stay with it and talk about it. I think this is great. And be be uh, out, uh, for, you know, and, and, and uh, um, keep talking about it, and keep thinking about it. I think this will come, whether we like it or not. I think, you know, it's a matter of time. Thank you. Thank you. So, ah, good. You're here. So we're gonna get quickly set up for our next. So let me just give a, I'll just give a quick introduction so we can keep moving along. Uh, we'll run the same form as I've talked about before. I'll give a quick introduction. I will go quickly around the room and he'll give a preparatory statement. Um, I'm happy to introduce uh, Professor Chris Danford. He is a applied mathematician from the University of Vermont. Uh, his background, oh, he's also at the Vermont Complex Systems Center. His background is in the application of chaos theory and climate change, or climate prediction, sorry, I didn't mean the change in there for you. <laughs> and his current work is exploring human behavior through building of instruments for computational social science, something I've always been really interested in too. So let's do a quick introduction around the table. John Dooley, a retired coach. Jay Dobson, recent medicine physician with the Brian Breslin, uh, civil engineer. Brian Sheehan, clinical social worker. Donna Rizzo, I hope I'm a friend of yours. <laughs> <laughs> Jill Sharpo, uh, President of Vermont AFL-CIO. 
CIO retired from the carrier. Mark Holmes, Chief Technology Officer. Joe Sigali, Agency of Transportation and Policy Planning Research. Milo Kress, I'm a high school student. Okay, well, uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I think it's an incredibly important thing that you're doing. I'm really happy to be here to talk to you. Um, this is something that I've been thinking about a lot for the last decade. And uh, I think that in talking about issues related to uh, data and how society is, is using data today and producing it, it's always helpful to have good analogies. So uh, I'm gonna start with one of those and, and see where we go from there. Okay. So. Um, <clears throat> For the purposes, I saw you're, you're going to define artificial intelligence in, in a 10 minute window of time later. I'm impressed. Allow me, actually. So I thought I'd just start by saying that I'm going to interpret it uh, for what I'm going to talk about today to refer to social systems and processes involving algorithmically aided decision making in those systems. Um, okay, so my background is in weather prediction, as Eugene said, and uh, it's, it's really, I think, the most widely known algorithmic decision support system, something that we're very familiar with, uh, and it's one of the great success stories in science. Uh, in the 70s, uh, we knew from theoretical models that anything beyond a two-week forecast would forever be out of reach uh, due to the chaotic atmosphere, but we launched satellites and observe the Earth, and our understanding of, of the way things work went from very scarce on data to rich. Uh, these cameras orbit the Earth and beam millions of measurements per hour into some of the most advanced algorithms that have ever been conceived. And today, these algorithms run on powerful supercomputers inferring the weather in locations like the upper atmosphere where the satellites can't observe. All told, the system produces 10 billion, 10 billion individual numbers, reflecting our best estimate of the Earth's atmosphere at any given moment, including right now. The laws of physics are then used to project several slightly different estimates of this state of the atmosphere forward, not just to give us a forecast, but an estimate of how likely uh, it is to be, an uncertainty estimate. And remarkably, hurricane forecasts are now accurate up to a week in advance which allows people to evacuate and, uh, and save lives. So despite the inherent uncertainties, uh, the system works and it really is quite incredible. So similarly, I think that the activity that we engage in online and on our phones uh, is transitioning our understanding of human behavior through a data-enabled phase transition, much like happened when we launched satellites. Uh, like it or not, we share an increasingly revealing amount about ourselves online. Uh, scientists, politicians, and advertisers can now leverage high-resolution information about our political opinions, our purchasing habits, and our daily patterns of life. As you're probably aware, our digital trace data is being used to inform decisions made by organizations in virtually every sector of our economy. Public health agencies are using searches on Google to monitor and predict the spread of the flu. Advertising agencies are micro-targeting demographic groups on Facebook. And political campaign messages are being tuned to correspond with our individual personalities. Attention to the promise and peril of these efforts is warranted. Imagine, for example, this is on the upside, um, that the devastating cognitive impairments associated with Alzheimer's were preceded a decade in advance by subtle changes in language use, vocal signature, or patterns of movement. Given a secure mechanism by which your doctor could passively monitor these behavioral attributes, for example, by an app on your phone and a smart algorithm ingesting the data, patients could potentially receive a diagnosis and treatment years ahead of current best practice. Along with researchers at Harvard, Peter Dodds and I recently found predictive signals of depression and PTSD in images posted to Instagram and activity on Twitter, in some cases up to a year before people were formally diagnosed. Uh, millions of the people in the US suffer from these debilitating mental illnesses and go undiagnosed for years. Since most of them have a mobile phone, our proof of concept work demonstrates that it may be possible to screen individuals 
for symptoms well before they become aware of a problem. My colleagues at the Vermont Complex System Center, including Donna here today, um, we're developing AI-inspired solutions to big problems facing our nation's critical infrastructure. For example, our aging electric grid, grid and uh, algorithmic trading in our financial markets, as well as the systems in which complex behavior has emerged through evolution on networks. For example, the signatures of addiction in the adolescent brain and the spreading of disease. We recently received a gift of $5 million from Mass Mutual Life Insurance to establish a center of excellence in complex systems and data science. Our work will focus on understanding the relationship between physical and financial health, as well as increasing fairness in algorithmic decision making. We aim to train a cohort of ethically minded data scientists for the future, integrating talented humanities colleagues like philosophy faculty member Randall Harp into our research and program discussions. In balance with clear potential upsides of AI, uh, there are certainly many risks associated with increased adoption of algorithmic decision making. The challenges are made all the more difficult by our own human involvement. It's difficult to envision how society will adapt to future changes in technology. Uh, the hurricane I mentioned earlier does not swerve uh, in response to an accurate forecast of its track. In contrast, awareness of AI will lead to unpredictable reactions in society. For example, some individuals have taken to wearing special patterns of makeup to thwart facial recognition technology. The present state of affairs leads to several important questions. Should companies like Facebook, whose employees uh, use AI to surface live streaming suicide attempts so that they can call for emergency services, should Facebook be subject to the same rules governing other healthcare practitioners? Given their repeatedly demonstrated inability to protect our personal communications, as well as the lack of transparency they offer into their algorithmic decision making, we cannot trust that they will police themselves. Indeed, the entire social media industry is predicated on the idea that we pay for services not with money, but with our far more valuable individual and collective attention. The average citizen likely imagines a neutral, emotionless, cold calculating machine when they think of AI. But in reality, AI systems trained on our behavior will exhibit the same biases that we humans suffer from in our own often imperfect and irrational decision making. Without guarantees that AI be required to learn from data representative of diverse demographic and socioeconomic groups, as well as mechanisms to interrogate AI-based decisions, it will be difficult to establish a system of accountability. Regulatory actions should not focus on AI specifically, but rather on access to the data upon which algorithmic learning relies. Just as the healthcare community takes great pains to protect the privacy of medical records, the data we produce through our internet and mobile phone activity should be treated with the same care as our most private medical data. It should not be sold and resold and resold. We should also require that decisions made by AI systems be subject to some basic level of transparency. For example, the insurance industry should mandate that policy offers made by AI algorithms are accompanied by clear explanations of rates, even if the rates are determined through algorithmic underwriting. This requirement would promote the new industry of AI auditing, an important step toward increasing fairness and accountability, and reduce the likelihood that these algorithms will unknowingly identify proxies for protected categories such as race. Finally, practitioners of AI should take a Hippocratic oath for data ethics. Given its reputation for social justice work and its growing research infrastructure in AI, Vermont has the potential to become a national leader in the ethical practice of data science. So, questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So, you mentioned that um, you made an analogy about how tracking information about climate and the atmosphere yeah. has allowed us to predict in a way we never thought we would the behavior of the atmosphere. And you made an analogy between that and how everyone almost 
in, at least in the United States, is walking around with a little tracking device on them, right? And that their behavior is being monitored by a variety of artificial intelligence, that data is being gathered, and at some point that can be used to predict human behavior. And, and what I'm curious is if you could connect that more to like health um, and mental health. Okay. If, if there's any examples sure. maybe of how you see that might, you gave the one about like you know, how your doctor can track your behavior, yeah. but I, I, I'm just wondering if there's other examples that you see either that are happening or that are about to happen. Yeah. Well, um, I think that one important difference between the atmosphere and our behavior is that we really understand the physics and could write down equations to describe how energy moves around. And that's the main reason why it works so well. It became a problem of just being able to observe where are we now. Um, with respect to the, you know, the data we produce with our phones and our interactions online, you know, there's no equation like F equals MA uh, that we have from a textbook. And, and so uh, a lot of the work right now is just trying to observe and describe it very well and explain what people's behavior is like. Um, there's an enormous number of studies coming out now showing that uh, the data that we share, the likes we click on, on articles on Facebook groups, we uh, agree to be a part of, uh, the words we use, the, even the mechanics of how we interact with, with social media, the uh, times of day, the frequency with which we post, things like that has all been shown to be predictive of mental health conditions like depression and PTSD. Um, and, and so the, the, the concept there is that, that people are uh, going about their day interacting online. They, they haven't consented necessarily to have um, the future state of their health be visible to the world. They may not realize the signals they're giving off, and most people don't realize it either. Maybe you can flip through your Instagram feed and get a sense that this person in your life is not doing well. But um, when people sign up to be a part of this system, they don't, they don't necessarily, well, they definitely don't read the terms of service um, for how their data is going to be used. And we need to acknowledge, we need to acknowledge that, um, all of us, and say what, you know, what is it that we're consenting to when we go onto these sites? Because that's not made clear, and it's uh, future advances in technology like this will make it possible to predict things about us that we may not want to be sharing. Um, so with mental health, I think that the, there's, a, there's a lot of promise to, to being able to get people help sooner if the help's available, because we all have fun. You know, we all have phones and we're all interacting in ways that could be taken advantage of. Yeah. That, that's sort of what I was thinking. I mean, like, you didn't say this, but like I was imagining, like you're, you know, like what if we somebody it, you would say this? <laughs> <laughs> what if somebody um what if somebody was like googling things related to suicide or killing themselves, and then like you know they go to a bridge or they go to a gun store or they and then their phone automatically yeah. connects them to the hotline. So they're like, who's calling yeah. me? And it's a person saying. You know, this is very creepy, but I'm just yeah. saying, like, you know, you, maybe you would consent to this, or you know, if you're if you are suicidal, maybe you and your doctor install an app that does this to yep. like or something. But th that it's a person to say, what's going on? Yep. Like you've been looking up this stuff, and now you're you're going heading towards that that gorge, or you're heading towards the gun store. Yep. I mean, I, I was just thinking that, or the other thing too is like, you know, let's say I'm trying to lose weight. And like I have an app, and I consent, and it's tracking what I'm eating, and it's and then yeah. it's like don't eat that cheese, you know, at the reception, you know. <laughs> that's not happening now. I mean, that's how we have to work, right? They, that's right. Yeah. They, they, you know. So, so they basically, you're basically right. It, that, those sorts of things are happening now, and you, what you're talking about is kind of connecting to two different dimensions of data. In this case, it's what am I asking the internet about, and then where is my phone? Yeah. Right. And those, so those two pieces of, you know, if they get tied together, that becomes a lot more powerful. Uh, you know, Instagram about a year ago started, people search for depression or suicide. Instead of showing them images mentioning it, they, they first will show you a screen that says, here are some local resources if you're struggling. Hmm. So um, the, the social media companies, they, they, you know, they're, they're not really doing a great job handling the data. They're aware that people are upset about that. And um, there have been, you know, in, in that example with Instagram, efforts on their part to do something a little bit better. Uh, but they're driven by a totally different motive than, than you know, we individuals are. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, which you sort of just answered, but I'm not clear about, is uh, how you talk about identifying depression and post-traumatic stress syndrome. How does one, that's not with anybody's permission, that's as I'm 
starting to understand, maybe incorrectly, that people use these services and the artificial intelligence within them makes this connect and then it informs them via their... Yeah, so I, let me separate sort of research from practice. Um, the study that I described where we recruited people who have depression or PTSD and been formally diagnosed, you say, give us, act, do you consent to have us researchers look at the last year, two years of your social media activity and then train an algorithm to look at differences between your posts, your pictures, and, and, and people who are, you know, have never been diagnosed with those uh, mental health problems. So the, the algorithm, just given that data, finds things like, well, people who are depressed have darker photos. They have less faces in their pictures than people who, who have not been diagnosed with depression, for example. Um, so that's, a, you know, the, that's an outcome of a research project that was done by a, few, a handful of people on a tiny budget. And if we can do that, I'm, I'm quite sure that social media companies can be doing things like that to decide what you know, to show you to buy. Um, and so, you know, one of the, I, th I think that, you know, this is a great way to imagine getting people help, the individual you described, getting them help sooner. But it's also a great way to sell them stuff if they're, you know, if you, if you know what to put in front of them. And so that's, you know, that's where I think it's um, appropriate for us to have more, you know, societally, we need more awareness of what's predictable about us from the data we share online. I don't know if I answered your question well enough. Well, I was just, I, the I'm system just doesn't curious exist now. about people, oh, so it doesn't exist It doesn't now. exist now. You no. developed your research for yeah. the people that you had permission to That's right. utilize That's the information. That's right, yes. Okay, thank you. That was but if you log on to Facebook, you are being experimented on while well, you're on I the get side. That. Yep. Okay. So I was wondering, what you said, something that really struck me is just that it's not about AI, AI doesn't even necessarily be regulated. It's the data, the data need to be protected. And, um, and I'm wondering, like, at what's the right level to do that effectively at? What's the right government level? Because if we were to protect it at the state level, is that, I mean, would that really work? I mean, as soon as I drive into New Hampshire or anywhere else, I'm sort of open and exposed. And so is this, I mean, I think it's a good question for us to think about as a committee. It's like, what's the right role for the state yeah. in all of this? And so, is there any point at trying to protect a Vermonter's data? You know, saying that you know, Vermonter owns their data. Does that really well, is that going to matter? It's a good question. I don't, I don't have a great answer because I don't really understand you know, the, the hierarchy of what sort um, actions taken here would, would apply. But I think that as uh, a community that we think should be doing the right thing, as an act of um, leading the nation in what's obviously an incredibly important problem. You know, it, it, it may be that it would open up all kinds of problems as soon as you drive into New Hampshire, but it might be worth doing anyway. Um, not for the purpose of, you know, not because we think that someone who drives into, into uh, from Vermont into New Hampshire is gonna be protected all of a sudden or, or lose that protection, but as a statement about what's right. Yeah, so I don't know, I don't, I don't really know. Let me try another one on this line of, uh, it, it's really in your presentation, so, and I appreciate that you did it in writing first. So it's, it, it, it came up in uh, Joe's uh, comment. In my opinion, regulatory action should not focus on AI specifically, but rather on access to the data on which the learning relies. So help me with facial recognition on that distinction. Um, uh, facial recognition, of course, is a technology that has developed with a lot of AI to do it. On the other hand, you have to compare A and B, right? You have to compare an a, 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 a image that is me uh, to a new image that's uh, scanning to find out who the person is uh, to do it. Uh, if the concern is the uh, facial recognition run amok will be a system uh, that allows the uh, government to trace the location of individuals all times and all the things you can think of from that is. Uh, how then do you regulate it to keep it from being misused? Well, uh, I think that if you're looking to avoid having the government know where you are at all times, um, then algorithms that infer your location 
uh, from your, you know, from your face, those those shouldn't be connect. I mean, it just shouldn't be allowed to connect to the system that you're imagining. Um, if if you're thinking, you know, should we be able to arrest criminals who are, you know, there's some warrant out, we want to know where they are. You know, I, I don't I don't really um, I don't know where where the the line is between the data and the algorithm. But those algorithms are that's that's sort of like a solved problem. So you can't you know you can't turn around and say we're not going to learn how to identify people from their pictures. Um, you know, Facebook's got this 10-year challenge going on right now, and it's helping, you know, everybody's helping them with that problem, <laughs> when they're going to, how old they're going to be based on all kinds of things. So I, I think it's, um, that's a, it, it's a good example, actually, where like it doesn't make any sense to try and regulate the algorithm itself. But in terms of how the data is used, here are pictures, and it's, your loca and it's connecting a, your one aspect of your behavior, your location, to this other aspect. And that's those connections that I think the regulation should focus on. And, and siloing types of information from each other. Tom? Oh, so I totally agree that you can't regulate an algorithm because I mean, they morph all the time. I'm curious about like data control, like who owns the data regulation. Um, that's been very interesting. I've been working in Europe for the last couple of years, and GDPR was data data policy written by legislators. And so we don't write laws. But I'm curious what you think is, you know, do you think that our country is heading towards sort of data rights legislation? Should we? Or is there something we should be doing in the state you know, to either enhance that or avoid it? Well, uh, who owns um, my image? Who owns the metadata? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think that I, I think exactly that that's exactly what needs to happen because right now um, the data that we produce is becoming more and more valuable mm -hmm. to companies that can use it for things that we we don't consent to, and you know that's a reason I think to to think about what Vermont can do to is, regulate. Yeah. The, that that's usage, the usage of the data. Specifically, I mean, no, we're a small state, but yeah. just like food labeling or something, it might be an interesting, it might be, a, a, you know, impede business, but it might be a really interesting place to try something. Would you, do you have any ideas of what we would propose? Um, I, I think that I don't have a good formulated plan for you in that regard right now, yeah. um, but I think if the outcome of this, you know, effort is to is to figure out what that would look like. I would be very much in favor of it and in favor of contributing to it. I, mean, I think I think it's of all the things that we can do at this point, given like you said, the algorithms are going to change and they're. Um, but it's what you said. It's about how how stuff is used. Yes. Yeah. yeah. This is of course national data regulation. Can we realistically do something? at the state level as opposed to nationally and not yeah, solid. I don't know. But somebody has to start. And that's right. So there's, there's a leadership, I mean, there's a, there's a leadership role, I think, given. Yeah. There um, are other times that Vermont has done that, and quite unpopular, right? I was just saying to my daughter this morning, you can drive around, there's no billboards, it's kind of nice. And wouldn't it be nice if we drove around and we were a little bit less um, subject to advertising based on what our face looks like or what our position on the earth is and had some more control over how that information could be used to help us if you know if it turns out we're in crisis yeah, yeah. can I ask a question yeah um, so you mentioned that it's right we, we, as we've been saying in a lot of the questions it's not about specifically the algorithm or the uh, use of AI, but the access to data. And there's a specific um, example that you use that I'm kind of wondering about, about um, Facebook employees using AI to detect live streamed suicide attempts. And that, you know, do we then need to regulate them as we would a healthcare practitioner? Um, do, do you see a difference between Facebook employees using AI to detect this and let's say you just have a thousand Facebook employees constantly checking live streamed videos for this. Do you see a difference between using an algorithm and just having a thousand employees doing the same thing in so terms of regulation? There are thousands of employees, employees doing this, but there are billions of hours of video that are being streamed. And so in terms of the efficiency of the problem of trying to do something about what's obviously a terrible situation and how best to handle it, I think, um, it makes great sense for them to find uh, patterns of 
people's comments on the video, the content in the video, um, that are predictive of what the video is about. This is in real time. It's not, you know, looking back a week and see how long. So, uh, you know, there have been, you know, there have been lots of examples of where this has helped people and a few where it hasn't helped people for Facebook to be able to do this. But they have, you know, they have thousands of people uh, trying to take the outcome, output of an algorithm that has found these potentially difficult situations and figured out which ones to act on or not. And that, so I, if that's an example I think of that's, help, that's really helping people, largely. I, I agree. And yeah. so what do you think the regulatory differences would be if there were no AI involved in that process? Do you think there is um, more of a breach of privacy if it's a computer doing this versus individuals? I think that, uh, no, I, I don't see a difference in that case. Uh, you know, people are, it's, it's a very, very complex issue and I think, um, I bet if you, if you, you know, survey people, most of them would sign up and say, you know what, it's okay for Facebook to do this if they notice this in my, in my feed. Um, and that's, that's kind of how I think about this. And that, I, a lot of the things they do, you ask them, you know, a lot of things that Facebook does, you ask people, is this, you should you really, do? they would say no. So that, this is an example where I think it, you know, they're doing the right thing. So I, I mean, a hard question, but leading with the statement, right? So we're dealing with two separate issues. We're dealing with like, what is data privacy? And I think you made some, some uh, suggestions that maybe we need to consider more about ourselves to be private data, right? Like what we do yeah, with our phones. Yes, yeah. So there, there's that, right? And then there's the, you know, should, you know, what is it? What is AI, and how should it be allowed to interact with data that may or may not be private, right? Yeah. Um, so the first one, do you think? So you, you're out and about talking to people more often than I am about this issue, right? And you, I'm sure you're going to say that people are generally generally underinformed in this, right? I think so. Yeah. So, so on the data privacy issue and like what's being done with your phone. Yeah. So, would you make a recommendation on that to us to find some way to, as a become a catalyst of just better public awareness? That sounds great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, like, you know, high schools should have a class classes in this, and colleges should certify people who are going to be computer scientists and. Right. statisticians of companies that have some ethical training. Like there's certainly there's ways to infuse the workforce with you know some holistic thinking about this issue that right. I would be in favor of. Yes. Because the reason I bifurcated those two is just the fact that I think if we get to a point where we feel comfortable that our private data is being used when we uh, agree to it, where where and how we agree to it it probably gives us a lot more leeway in terms of the things that we're comfortable with with, with AI. I completely agree with that. Yeah. So, yeah. And I love the article that you sent about the hypocritic growth that people are going to become data scientists because it really is a new field now. And I think civil and environmental, civil, civil engineering, you know, we go through the order of the engineer, but essentially all it is is a hypocritic oath to do what's good for humanity and the public. And I think having that I mean, I know all of engineering is, is allowed to come and be a part of that, but it really is civil engineers that take advantage of that, wear a ring, a sand that you sign off our plans on, to remind yourself that people's lives are at stake. I think in doing that and labeling yourself in a profession, it draws a certain type of personality to those professions that want to act in that way. So I, I really, I mean, it's a lot of these things you might be talking about might just be maybe ceremonial, but I still think it's a really good thing for Vermont to maybe take the lead Where role in yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I like the mighty, but small but mighty. Small but mighty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, 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 that was a takeaway for me, for sure. <laughs> Chris, I proposed, only because when I got into this committee, I thought, oh my god, what am I getting myself into? Are we actually going to you know, put some kind of laws in place in Vermont? On small companies that start up here um, because it just seemed way too much to get your head around putting a we'll never be able to keep up with the laws because everything is changing so fast and the applications that have come out you can't kind of see what's going to happen in the future so my stance has always been why don't companies
companies just have to disclose their intentions fully when being like incorporated or when starting some of these applications. Because then well, if you used yeah. it in a manner that wasn't disclosed, maybe there's some way to go after somebody in some sort of law sense after the fact because they violated something that was supposed to have been done. It seems like, what's your opinion on something like that? I don't know. I mean, I think a lot of times companies uh, start trying to solve problem A, and then you know, tangentially, it's it's problem C that they realize is the valuable idea that they. And so I don't know if uh, if that. Um, but if the disclosure, so all they had to do was just disclose. I mean, it's a lot yeah. of the, the the things that we're really worried about are the things that people aren't willing to come clean on. It's yeah. usually the original, app, yeah. you know, invention. Yeah. I, I, think, I don't know that you ever know up front what you're going to go do because that will evolve. But one thing that strikes me as I, in my keto diet, not able to eat this cookie, is that this was an interesting law, this yeah. sort of labeling law. I mean, I think if you said AI and you know under the covers, that's too broad. But you could say here's the personal information, you know, a little very high level thing. As a matter of fact, we're being sued right now by, the, uh, by LA for misusing data from the weather company. Yeah, yeah, so and that, yeah. it's interesting because it's all clearly in the new one, but that's like putting it in the bottom of a file account, yeah. right? So it's in there, and I think, you know, so we're going, well, we did what the law said, yeah. but what if, what if there was some simple kind of unified labeling that yeah. said, you know, this software product uses this personal information yeah. in this way? And, and here's where you it fits on the single screen. Yeah, something that's at least it would be overly simplified, just like yeah. this yeah. is overly simplified. So I know I've eaten a thousand calories now because I've got seven of these. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> <Did you> really? <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, that's a good idea. Yeah. I mean, boiling it down, making but, the, I mean, yeah, it's it's not better. It's not but simply but making yeah, it understandable and consumable, yeah. yeah. even if you have to distill it, over distill it. Yes, I Interesting. agree. Even little icons, you know, map with a blinking cursor and a face, and you know, these are the things that yeah, we this uses face or layer, yeah. this uses position, you know, this uses, it could be very simple. Yes, yeah. exactly. I don't know if this is a natural lead in for our next thing on the open discussion. So, but before we do that, I'd like to give, do you have any last comments you'd like to make? Yeah, I guess one thing that I didn't emphasize at the end here was just that, uh, you know, we talked about the data, but um, one thing about artificial intelligence that I think could, that this group could um, focus on is what, how, um, how transparent and explainable it is, the output of it. And, you know, the reason the weather model that I started with the reason it ended up getting so good was that you had all this data, but we could also do experiments where we try to decide why it was making mistakes. So that we were talking about that earlier, in the last group we were talking about that, that, um, oh, when the weather looks like this, we make this type of mistake, and when it looks like that, we make this type of mistake. And after a long time, you can learn what it is to, um, what, what mistakes and biases exist in, in the model and fix it. And without those types of, uh, methods to interrogate algorithms, that it, it's going to be very difficult to make them better and make them more fair. So um, I don't know about uh, regulation in that regard, but certainly promoting awareness of the need for that. Um, you know, you can choose to fund, to suggest to the government that they fund explainable artificial intelligence in Vermont and these auditing uh, processes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, back to you. Yeah. Is any is there, uh, Patrick members? Is there anything you'd like to discuss? Or I think we had we had mentioned at the start that how are we going to get a report that's going to get submitted? Could we need to? I, Kayla kind of, yeah, just the, you know, the interim report that's going to the, the legislature in a month, less than a month. <laughs> we just want to, can, can we okay it by here? It's written, but we have to read it. It's on Slack. But my, so, can, can we okay it by email? Can we review it? And, uh, I see no reason why I can't do it. We need to integrate with the other side. So I'm going to volunteer okay. to work with Kayla to take her work put in the motion deck, which he is, of course, recorded, and send it around to everybody within a period. You will tell me, uh, uh, I 
sure. And then the email goes. I think there's nothing wrong with doing that for the purpose of this kind of thing. Just in terms of email notes, we all do copy all of them. Maybe I'm yeah, maybe confusing Slack is the right thing. So I'll look at Slack. Now that means everybody's got to go into Slack, uh, which I'd be an offender for this meeting. Uh, you have to go, you may call, but we'll uh, do that again, or will everybody do it? If we do review as a group of your document and we talk about it in emails as a group, are we violating some disclosures then? Probably among ourselves. So, uh, uh, how? But I think I can do this. I can do a draft of Kayla, and I can then send you all an email saying it's in Slack. Uh, and then the discussion phase uh, of it will occur openly in uh, Slack. Is that okay? I've heard it's okay because I can then share the discussion in Slack. But I've also heard you can email each other as long as you don't have a court. That's the problem. But that's yeah. a, as soon as you do, we're fine. Yeah, yeah, that's we're fine. Fine. So if you individually email, like, yeah, we can do individual time. emails, but uh, uh, emails to everyone is where the problem comes. So, uh, how, but how about the solution that we circulate it? Uh, uh, we do a draft on Slack. Um, let me say we get it done by February 1st. So that means there's 14 days for people to react and any changes to occur. And you must, uh, uh, and let's say uh, uh, till the 10th, I'm just doing this, and uh, I think it may be a correction, is the discussion period and after the 10th is a vote. Uh, uh, so that the vote gets done by the 14th. Sounds good. How, I'm a little confused about the voting part. We're not meeting. Uh, you just say, uh, like maybe we don't vote, but we just give you our approval and and or something like that. Is that okay? Okay. I think it's just that you're nothing to add. Nothing to yeah. add. Yeah. 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 I, I still can't see the report. Uh, Do you want me after? So, yeah, yeah, I was mean, right here for part of it, but not. Can you post it in general, or where did you? I said it's February report. Yeah. Or you, you have a channel called February report. Is there a, is there a better? Yeah, I got it. Perfect. I got it. So I'm going to say something. A person like me, I go to Slack as little as possible. I would prefer you email that thing to me so I can read it, decide if I have a comment, and then have a link so that when I press the link, I can go to where you're talking about. Okay, I'll do that with you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, the other, the other way to use email in this is to just generate individual letters with the, the document, like you just said, to each of us, and then we just respond to her. Right? Well, that's what I, I will do with her. But I'm assuming in general that people... No, I would like to have that thing so I can see what other people say. But as far as me trying to go in there and find it on Slack, I don't think really that's it. Well, if you just send something. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's, that's oh, okay. exactly what I asked. Or do you just have to resend? Well, I just put a link to it in the general. So is it, this is a motion? Do we, is I it was an offer. If somebody wants to make a motion, you drop it. If you want, I'll make a motion consistent with my I offer. <laughs> I just would like to say thank you for um, stepping up yes. as being the leader of that piece. And, um, and then the other thing I'd just like to say is the group should think about if we're invited to the committee to talk, um, who can do that? Do we want to have some spokespeople or just have everyone go and have something? Think about it. Like, I don't have a suggestion. I'm in the building, so I'm happy to go, but I'm, I'd actually prefer as a legislator to just sit with you while you talk. But I'd want to see it, you know. But think about who would be our spokesperson. It, is it? I don't have it in front of me. Is it Senate and House Committee? Oh, um, I, I think it's the Senate Committee that we're it, It's actually the House um, Energy and Technology yeah. Committee and the Senate Government Operations yeah, okay. Committee. Both. It's, but there's one involved. Yes. So it's two appearances. Yes, yeah, two glorious. Can I after the after the June? No, or or the. Oh, um, you know what? The, what I was saying is that when you submit the report in February, if we were invited. No, we're not required to, but I'm just thinking they may want you to come in and talk. 
Okay. They may want to talk, you know, ask you questions about, I don't know. So I was just saying, if we're not, I, I don't believe we're required to appear. Well, you might so. be proactive about it and ask to, to talk. Yeah. I think it would probably help to have a few people go in and, and after after the committee reviews the report, have a, a answer questions, you know, and talk I would have it. I want to apologize. I deleted that picture. You're right. I think the more we, the more proactive we are communicating our needs, and the sooner, the better. So, like, if someone wanted to um, reach out before the reporting deadline and just say heads up, we need more time, and we're going to explain in our report. I mean, I'm happy to go to the committee chair and do that. Um, or if you want to do it as the chair of this group, reach out to the committee. It might be helpful. Uh, I can. I'll, I'll make that my my task. Okay. Can I ask one question about the report since we're informed? So I read what you wrote, um, Kayla, and I like it, but it's really a, a report of what we've done. There's no kind of pointing forward of here's where we're focusing or here's what's emerging themes. Do we not want to do that in February? Or maybe it's premature. I mean, I would, if I were receiving I that, I would say, you know, yeah. I mean, you know. I think that's what she was tasked to do, though. I understand. You did exactly that. what you yeah. were asked. What I'm wondering is, do we want uh, some sort of a, uh, a synopsis of our findings so far? I think we should have a direction. If we, we can do that, I think that's going to take another meeting. You're, you're not going to, yeah, I don't think you're going to do think, that by. Yeah, we haven't discussed that enough. I agree, but I, I would, I'm just going right over to saying, I would be disappointed to get just, I mean, you did exactly, not, not nothing you did, but I would kind of go, you know what, I paid for it, no, they didn't pay for it, but <laughs> they haven't paid for anything. But, uh, but I wasn't, yeah. the, for our I path, agree. the way we decided the path was to do information gathering right up to the That's report, hard. and all you can really say is, we information gathered. <laughs> we are going to list the topics, right? Yeah. So yeah, I think they, they are listed. Nice they are listed. Really and, nice and maybe just a maybe a link to the minutes in the report, like saying like, and for more detail, check out here's our minutes. If you want, you know, so if people really want to, they can go look and read through the details. The minutes are pretty detailed, you know, in our agenda. You know, so people could get more info, and and maybe even saying in the report that it's been on Orca. So if people want, they can, yeah, they can go. If they want, they can go uh, check out the videos. Maybe I misunderstood the beginning, though. The, I thought the reason that we might be asking for an extension was so that we could take it a little bit further and, and add the recommendations. Yes. Isn't that the idea? Yeah. Yes. Uh, we were just talking about reporting what our topics covered, were, okay. uh, not recommendations okay. yet, right? So, so I think it should have a little more substance. I think that we should indicate some of the areas that we've heard some here today that might require some sort of recognition. I think we should, we should be mentioning that at this time. But just, uh, I did my reading, it's not really writing the report. It's a, this is an update, though. It's not, a, it's not I, I don't think they were one of the recommendations halfway through the process. Mm, I don't I, I'm pretty I'm sure that the, yeah, I'm pretty, pretty sure that the intention of that wasn't give us your recommendations halfway through and then give us more later. It was, Tell us where you're at halfway through, and just to, it's a way to make sure people are actually doing the work. You know, I can contact the chair and see what they're looking. For. That's a great idea. For yeah. specifics. I think that's a good idea. And I think it's. I mean, I I would be really. It'd be hard to make any recommendation right now. Yeah. Because while we yeah, heard, but we, well, we've heard some things that we want to know more about. But yeah, I mean, it, but what we heard today was, you know, think about regulations maybe on data, but like the, one of the speakers, one of the business owners, the last time this year said. Whatever you do, don't start regulating things and scare everybody. Exactly. Away. Yeah. So yeah. you know, I, yeah. we haven't had a chance to synthesize yeah. it yet. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm trying that to say. We need to meet again, or if we're really going to do a nice report, or we're just going to hand in our half-ass homework and there we go. And I will accept the description as half-ass homework uh, <laughs> because once we decided that we were in the information gathering stage at this time. Uh, the substantive uh, reaction to any of it uh, hasn't occurred yet. That's my problem with going further. And if that occurs on the third in February, then the February 24th or 7th, what 
Can someone just remind me what's happening on that meeting? Uh, I described it earlier. It's the, the justice uh, law enforcement. Uh, it's another session like this. But as I said, I hope we have some national speakers that you'll get. Oh, and that means yeah. that yeah. I thought you were talking about having those people up there. No, no, that's for the 22nd. Yeah. Okay. It might, um, it might be helpful in the report to, to say, um, to explain the process uh, in terms of we've done, we, the first two meetings were organizing ourselves. The following three, is this our fifth one or sixth one? I believe fifth. Fifth one, yeah. The following four, because it's going to be next week too, were information gathering, at which point we're going to pivot and do some community engagement and synthesis. And like, I, I would say that, that if we go to them and we say, this is what we've done so far, we don't have any recommendations, but we've looked into these topics, and this is our plan going forward, that that's adequate, and speculating what the recommendations may be isn't really responsible, you know? So is that our point? I, I want to say that we're going to speculate. No, we're going to say these are areas. I haven't read the cable world, so obviously I shouldn't be talking about nothing. But um, these are areas that we need to look at. I mean, we already know that uh, protecting people's data, which is not rocket science here, how are we going to do that? That's one thing that we're going to look at. And you talked quite a bit about the responsible issues, uh, just things that that just say this is the direction we're going in. Not that we've finalized anything, but these are the questions that we have and we can answer. And On the theme of education, that mm -hmm. was coming up as a thing that we... I, I, I just, that's what I, mean. I hear your concerns. I guess I just think of it like, if I may use an analogy, like when in social work you do a clinical assessment before you make a treatment plan with somebody. And I would never say to my patient halfway through an assessment what their recommendations should be because I haven't completed my assessment. So I, they, if, they, if they're pressuring me for that, I would say, these are the issues you've mentioned, and these are possible interventions, but I don't have any recommendations yet. You know what I mean? So maybe I'm thinking of it too rigidly, but I feel like it's premature at the fifth meeting to give any kind of recommendations, almost like irresponsible. Like, we might say something and then be totally off because there's some, some asteroid coming. Or something that we haven't heard. Maybe that's that. So one of the other guys, we're on top of that. Tax, which is coming over. <laughs> it does seem like we all agree, though, on um, on everything but the recommendations part, right? Well, like, so if we. Um, I guess it depends on what recommend. You know, at what phase we're calling a recommendation, right? Because I I look at our role as one. We were to try to understand a topic that had very little understanding at you know, any sort of executive body, governmental level. And then there was determine what are the opportunities that may come from this, you know, issue or set of technologies, and then what are some of the risks. So I think what we can say at this point is maybe we've gotten through the phase of, of understanding of what AI is, what are, you know, what machine learning is, um, you know, we recognize, you know, we recognize that there's probably some changes that we need to make in terms of making the rest of the public aware of these things that we can probably recommend in that, just in that realm. But we're not ready to start issuing recommendations for the next set of things, which are, you know, like what are the opportunities, what are the risk, right? I would really favor language like what you, I think you just convinced me, and I think you said the same thing. It's just at the bottom say that. While we're getting lots, just to explain why are we not saying more, just to say we've gotten lots of input, but you know we're just beginning. You know we're we're still doing our fact finding, and we would like to, we would explicitly like not to make recommendations at this point for fear that they'd be off. So rather than just say here's what we did, we can say here's what we did, and we're explicitly not going to go uh, go for you know project forward because it's. Right. Furthermore, yeah, we need that, more time. I mean, we're asking for more time. Yeah, you know? That means so it's we, that we, we, we didn't, we didn't right. think you yeah. were curious. Yeah. Okay, just, I can do that. Does that make sense? Yes. Well, thanks for doing it. Thanks for doing that. And thanks for the panel today. I, I, I actually saw, I went to Slater. Oh, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I,
want to just, if I may, I received the public comment period was early on before we arrived. Yes, yeah, certainly might let people talk again later. If I could just make a brief comment. Please. Uh, I'd introduce myself, Bill Lippert, Representative Bill Lippert from Heinsberg. I chair the House Health Care Committee, and most of the members of our committee attended this afternoon. Brian Gina is also a member of our committee. And I wanted to say that the informal feedback that I heard from our members was very positive and enthusiastic about being uh, able to be here this afternoon. We chose to come here rather than take testimony on another topic at the State House, so and to take advantage of what you're doing. Um, I would also say that uh, because our committee, I think, uh, was very pleased to be here and positive about all that we took in, there can be some informal communication as well within the State House that the House Health Care and Technology Committee is chaired by our former ranking member and uh, are like two doors down the hall. So I can assure you that there will be probably some informal communication as well. And I, I think you should, uh, I mean, I would, I would encourage you to possibly even extend an invitation to members of that committee to attend in the way that we attended at some point, point in time. I think that would be a way to engage them further. Uh, whether they choose to do it or can do it, you know, you can't tell. It was serendipitous for us to be able to do this today. Uh, but I think, uh, I think you should uh, feel free to engage, and uh, I can assure you there will be some informal communication about the positive work of your groups. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. So could you give us a little recommendation on the report thing that we were struggling with? I, I, well, I just say I think, I feel like the what, what was being articulated toward the end of you know, what you outline what you've done and indicate that the reason you're looking to do more is that you need more time, that you're well into your process of wanting to form the late recommendations. I haven't gotten to that point. And I think that's a completely appropriate level of reporting at this point in time. And, uh, and, and I would just say that I would informally support your request for an extension. <laughs> Yeah. And, 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 and I'd ask that you whisper to the Judiciary Committee that next, the 22nd on February will be. That's true.